Good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Mead Smith. I'm the president of the Washington Policy Center. Welcome to the first ever, ever virtual solution summit. Washington Policy Center Solution Summit is one of the largest state policy events of its kind in our state, and we have over 350 people registered to join us over the next two days. It has become a must attend annual tradition for lawmakers, local officials, candidates, media, and citizen activists across the state. It gives us, as a research organization, a chance to highlight the work of our research centers, talk about some of the biggest policy challenges in our state, and how those challenges might be overcome using free market based solutions. It's also an interactive event. So it gives our research team the chance to answer questions that often bring new perspectives, new challenges, and new solutions to light. Today, as many of you know, we originally planned to have a full day agenda at the Bellevue Hyatt with a breakfast, lunch keynote, an evening wine reception, even movie screenings. The original event had more breakout sessions and panel topics than ever before, and our keynote lunch speaker was supposed to be former U.S. Energy Secretary and former Governor of Texas, Rick Perry, who, by the way, will be doing a future event with us, so stay tuned. Obviously, all this was planned before the COVID-19 pandemic. As the restrictions required by the COVID-19 response became clear, we had to cancel the physical gathering. As Washington State became a beachhead for what the virus would inflict across our country, our research team quickly focused on examining the COVID-19 response and its aftermath in their respective areas of study. They've published solid recommendations and analysis on topics like expanding our healthcare system, reducing risk in transportation, giving parents more of their tax dollars to improve their children's education opportunities, and policies that will aid the ability of people to return to work, all of which are available by going to our one-stop shop page for COVID-19 related policy analysis, which is featured on our WashingtonPolicy.org homepage. Despite these new challenges, we decided that the Solution Summit should continue. As it turns out, what we have planned for the next two days still makes this the largest Solution Summit ever, and we're very grateful you decided to be a part of it. We usually alternate the location of the Solution Summit between Spokane and Bellevue. We want the whole of the state represented, so we alternate between Eastern and Western Washington. But with this being the first virtual Solution Summit, it removes all the geographical barriers that, make, that might have stopped someone from attending and makes this a truly statewide event. We have people participating from Spokane to Seattle and from Whatcom County to Walla Walla. So this really is a statewide event. Thank you for being with us. Let me share with you what to expect over the course of the next two days. Each day we'll have four policy sessions. Each session by a center director who will share details from their work, give you an audience Q&A. This information will be repeated throughout the program. Here's how you can ask a question. If you're unfamiliar with GoToWebinar, you'll note there is a toolbar located on the right side of your screen. In it, you'll see a chat function. If you have a question for any panelists, simply type it in. Our staff will be collecting those questions throughout the presentation and posing them to panelists during the Q&A period. You can also email questions anytime to our communications director, David Bowes, at dbowes at washingtonpolicy.org. That's D-B-O-Z-E at WashingtonPolicy.org. Many of you have already downloaded the full agenda, which was emailed to you in your reminder email. But for those who haven't, here's a breakdown of what to expect. We will host panels on eight topics, four panels of approximately 45 minutes each. As noted, every panel will have a Q&A period and following each panel will be a five minute break. During the breaks on your screens, you will see some of our recent policy videos, including our animated series, which helps break down state policy in a simple, fun way, and videos from our series of charter school students, in which students relate why their school is important to them. You'll also see our event sponsors, without whom none of this would be possible. Solution Summit event sponsors include the Associated Builders and Contractors of Western Washington, Assured Partners MCM, Avara, Coldwell Banker Bain, 
Dun Lumber, Nika, Trico, Wells Fargo, Bristol Myers Squibb, Merck, The Boeing Company, Takeda, Dairy Gold, the Ethnic Chamber of Commerce Coalition, Physicians Insurance, and American Printing. I want to thank each of our sponsors for giving us this opportunity to highlight our work and share it with you. I want to offer a special welcome to the TVW audience and thank TVW for live streaming this event. TVW has an impressive record of keeping Washingtonians informed of key policy issues and public affairs, and we are honored to be included in their programming. And stay tuned for a special announcement about TVW at the end of today's program. Over the course of the next two days, we will cover eight topics, including seven areas of research. Today's topics will be innovating for the earth, how technology is helping the environment in ways that politicians cannot, free market solutions to healthcare reform, no income tax, how to protect Washington's competitive advantage, and the overregulation of small business owners in Washington State. After the final panel, I'll be back to close the day and present our annual summit award to an organization that has been instrumental in making Washington State government more transparent and accessible to people across our state. Tomorrow, we'll begin the day at 8 a.m. again with a topic made all the more timely by recent headlines exclaiming that socialism has gone mainstream and polls showing a growing enthusiasm among younger generations for socialism in the United States. Tomorrow's kickoff panel will be behind the curtain, America's dangerous flirtation with socialism from those who have lived it, one you'll not want to miss. Next will be drivers are not the enemy and how to move transportation policy towards solutions that improve mobility for everyone. Then we'll turn towards education and our final panel will be bridging the urban rural divide, knowing where your food come from, comes from a topic made more pressing by the recent strain on our nation's supply chains. Then I'll come back at the end of the day tomorrow to announce two of our keynote speakers for our annual dinner events coming up this fall in Bellevue and Spokane. When it's all over, if you haven't done so already, we hope you'll join Washington Policy Center as a member. If you make a special contribution of $50 or more today, you'll receive a copy of WPC's Healthcare Policy Analyst, who you'll hear from shortly in the second panel, Dr. Roger Stark's new book, Healthcare Policy Simplified, Understanding a Complex Issue. And be sure to join us on our social media pages and check out washingtonpolicy.org for the latest on our blog and publications. Thank you again for joining us for this first ever virtual solution summit. Don't forget to ask questions. We want you to be involved. Just check for the chat function in the toolbar at the side of your screen. Or again, email dboze, dboz at washingtonpolicy.org. To launch our first panel, I'm going to turn the program over now to our Center for the Environment Director and author of the book EcoFads, Todd Myers. Todd? This is, uh, so this is new for all of us and um, a little bit difficult, so I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody um, across the state. So I'm excited uh, to introduce our speaker, but before we do that, I want to uh, talk a little bit about where we are um, in terms of environmental policy and why innovating for the earth is so important. Um, and so if you can go ahead and uh, share my screen. All right. <clears throat> so um, the reason that people think about environmental policy in terms of primarily going to the government is, is that we've had good success that way. In the 1970s, when we created the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, um, it worked because we had big outfalls into the river, we had big smokestacks, and government was particularly good at targeting those sorts of problems. And so now, with that success, people think, well, we can do that same thing again with the problems we face today. But in 2009, Bill Ruckelshaus, who was the first EPA director, of course, and um, passed away recently, uh, wrote a great piece talking about how different the environmental problems are today than what we faced in the 1970s. And he made a great point, which said that yesterday's solutions worked on yesterday's problems, but we need new ways to address the problems that we have today. 
and that political solutions may not be the best way to do that. And there's a few reasons why. First is, is that politicians are rewarded for coolness, for the coolness of their ideas, not necessarily for the effectiveness. Solar panels are cool, they create free energy. Electric vehicles are cool because they're fast. And so politicians wanna be associated with cool things, even if there are better ways that are less sexy to help the environment, we tend to subsidize the sexy things, even if they're ineffective. Second, politicians are rarely held accountable for failure in environmental policy. Here in Washington state, um, uh, Greg Nichols, when he was mayor, uh, started the US Conference of Mayors Climate Protection Agreement, saying that they would meet certain CO2 targets by 2012. <clears throat> but when 2012 came around, they had missed all of those targets. And when I called people in Washington state, cities in Washington state who had signed up to see if they had met their targets, what I found is, is that about two thirds of them hadn't even tried, they hadn't even tracked it. And yet none of those people were held accountable, either because they were already gone or because they had, people had forgotten and moved on. And the last is, is that the politicians don't have complete information. Having worked at the state uh, environmental agency, we had a lot of information, but fundamentally the people on the ground who were closest to the problems had the best uh, solutions. And <clears throat> so if you're trying to solve environmental problems, you can't do it um, if you don't have the best information. So how do we overcome those things? Well, I wanna give the example of ocean plastic. And what we see is, is that while politicians do the best with the tools they have, innovators create new tools. And that's where we are really gonna solve some of these problems. So there's a great organization up and based in Vancouver, BC called Plastic Bank. And what they do is that they pay people in the parts of the world where you're seeing plastic pollution, Indonesia, the Philippines, Brazil, Egypt, Haiti, all of these places have poor systems to collect plastic and collect trash. And so what Plastic Bank does is that they pay people, and you can see a person here turning in some plastic to a little location. Plastic Bank buys it, recycles it, and then sells it to SC Johnson and other companies who then use that to put it into Windex bottles and other things like that. You're using those financial incentives and it's all done on their phone where they collect it and, and register it. And we're actually gonna talk with one of the co-founders of Plastic Bank on Earth Day uh, with the young professionals at 7 p.m. So they're a really interesting organization, but they were able to do this because it's international. No single government can address this problem. And the tools that we have in, in the United States, like, <clears throat> like banning plastic bags, do very little for this global problem. Things like Plastic Bank make a big difference and they are having a real impact. And you can see how many kilograms of ocean plastic that they have already um, uh, stopped from going into the ocean. I'll give one more quick example before we turn to um, our guest, um, which is that if you are a birder, um, that there is an app that you probably have used called eBird. And eBird was created by Cornell University as a way to collect some data about where birds are. And once they put it on an app, the amount of data exploded. And so here you can see and all these little dots about where people have sighted different birds and the types, and you can keep your checklist. And if you're a birder, it keeps your life list so you know what birds you've seen and where. But now once you have all that data, you can start to make decisions. And so Cornell University is able to say, based on all of those um, uh, data points that they have entered, people have entered through the app, they can say, here's where you see different birds. And this is a cedar waxwing, one of my favorite birds. Um, and it shows where you can see the cedar waxwing based on the data that they have received. But they can also do environmental protection with it. And in California, they created a program called Pop-Up Wetlands where they took the data about where seabirds were, went to farmers who had property right where the data showed that the seabirds would be passing through, and asked them, how much would we have to pay you to create a wetland, to flood your field during January and February during migratory season? And they did a reverse auction and came up with a financial reward for farmers that did this. But the key thing is that they had the data from the citizen science from the app to do this in a way that they never could before. These are the exciting innovations that are going on that are changing the way that we help the environment and are addressing the problems that Bill Ruckelshaus talked about. 
So these two uh, quotes stand out at me. Our guest um, is from AI for Earth. I talked with uh, Michelle uh, Lancaster um, about a year ago, and she one of the things she said that struck me was environmental problems are getting larger, and the only thing that can keep up with this is technology. And our guest is Bonnie Lay from AI for Earth at Microsoft. And I, I looked at, I watched one of her speeches and she said, I kept thinking that it has to be something we can do in order to make this work faster. That's what started me thinking about technology as a tool to help the environment. So let me introduce Bonnie. Bonnie is a founding member of the head uh, global strategic partnerships of Microsoft's AI for Earth program, a five year, $50 million cross company effort uh, dedicated to delivering technology-enabled solutions for global environmental challenges. Previously, uh, she worked in the field and she helped initiate a marine program for wildlife conservation in Myanmar. She'd also discovered a new sea slug species in the Caribbean and researched climate adaption of endangered penguins in South Africa. So let's please welcome uh, Bonnie. She has great stuff to say. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction, and it's such a pleasure to be with all of you today. And I'm excited to chat a little bit more about what we've been doing with AI for Earth and how we've been thinking about technology um, as the solution for the different environmental challenges that we're facing. So I'm going to work on sharing my screen now with you guys, and hopefully you'll be able to see it in just a second. All righty. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to give it a second, and I think the screen should be able to be shared with all of you soon. Um, and so uh, exactly like was mentioned quickly in my introduction, um, I actually did not come from working in technology or business. I was trained as a conservation biologist, and I was focused on thinking about how it is we could work together with human communities to think about how we could conserve some of the most endangered species. Um, and so one of my projects previously was working in Myanmar, where my grandmother is originally from, thinking about how we could work on establishing more sustainable community-based fisheries and setting up some of the right um, monitoring systems in place so we actually have an understanding of how the fish stocks were varying over time. So as you can imagine, some of that fundamental data that's incredibly important for scientists and then policymakers as well to think about how process, um, how process is happening um, and whether or not progress is being made. Um, but uh, exactly um, as, as was mentioned, uh, I started to find as I was working the field that the work was just not happening quickly enough. We were working on setting up community monitoring systems, working with local fishermen, but we oftentimes find um, what you see pictured in this situation to, um, into this picture, which is we came across um, one of the largest catches ever recorded um, illegally um, of some of these endangered ray species. Um, and so that got me thinking a lot about, well, if some of our current systems are not catching up to the sorts of environmental work we need to do, what are some of the ways we could leverage other tools so that we have a hope of being able to keep up pace? Um, and that really started to get me um, in, more involved in the world of technology and thinking about how it is that we could take some of the latest technological innovations and apply them specifically um, to the work that's being done in the environmental space. Um, and as many of you probably are aware of, we are in a moment uh, in our planet where we're facing some incredibly dire environmental situations. Um, scientific studies have shown that we need to keep our global temperature rise to a maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius if we are to have any hope of maintaining um, a sustainable life on our planet. And we've already gone up to uh, more than one degrees Celsius increase. Um, to for, for that temperature um, maximum, the, our atmosphere can only absorb 420 gigatons more of carbon dioxide. Um, and if we're again projecting based off of um, current current trends, we're going to hit that maximum um, in less than in less than 10 years. And our current climate models, um, more than two thirds of them are showing that we're going to be bypassing um, these maximums. Um, all of this happening while 
our human population is going to be increasing um, at more than um, 2 billion people. And so again, all of these are happening at rates that are going to be, if we're doing business as usual, if we're sort of maintaining current processes, this is not going to be um, helping us stay on a sustainable future. All righty. Um, and so it's, it was really interesting for me coming from the world of science, coming from working directly with communities to start thinking about what is the role that businesses could actually play um, and what are some of the some of the things that large businesses could actually have incredible influence over. Um, and so it's thinking a lot about, again, how businesses, as they think about the ways that they operate, can reduce their own exposure to risk, um, can avoid contributing to additional environmental problems and think about how in the ways that they're operating, um, how they could actually contribute to building sustainable solutions. seeing if this is progressing. Um, and so specifically at Microsoft, um, we're thinking about, number one, how it is that we could minimize the environmental footprint of our business operations, um, and then um, conversely, maximize the positive impact of the technical products that we're making, as well as the, tech, um, as well as the technological policies we're advocating for, um, and environmental policies that we're advocating for, and the partnerships that we're forming and making. Um, and so at Microsoft, we've actually been um, carbon neutral since 2012, and this is through a system um, pretty innovative um, at the time, um, which is a true internal carbon fee that we levy across all of the different business groups. So this is everything from um, the building um, and the lights that are being turned on by employees and business group to every flight that they're taking. Um, and it's um, currently at a $15 per metric ton of carbon um, fee. And that, um, that fee that is collected across the company then allows our central environmental team to look at how we could make the proper investments across four different priority areas of carbon, water, ecosystems protection, and waste, um, and across what we're sort of describing as four different pillars for ways that we operate. Um, so again, thinking about our own operations, how it is that we could minimize our impact and align with science, uh, scientific and international goals. Um, Second, how we could think about developing the products and services so that we could establish the preferred analytical platform and products for environmental solutions. Um, number three, how could we work with our customers and partners so that we could actually be able to help others on their own sustainability journeys um, as we're developing our own. Um, and finally, in policy, how could we advocate for the policies to achieve these corporate and societal goals? that we have established. And so some of you may have seen that in January of this year, we have came we came up with um, a new set of announcements um, where rather than just being carbon neutral, we're actually setting an ambitious goal of being carbon negative by 2030 so that we're actually taking out more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than we're putting out. Um, and with this trend um, of carbon negativity to actually be on track to remove all of the historic carbon emissions from Microsoft's entire operational history by the year 2050. Um, and as one of the ways to help achieve those goals, we realize that um, not all of the technologies are available to date to be able to meet these goals that we set for ourselves. And so also setting aside a $1 billion climate innovation fund, specifically to look at how it is we could help spur on these de the development of these technologies and bring their costs down down to a level where it actually would be able to allow for others to be able to actively participate um, in, in being able to um, part, um, you know, to be able to work on their own plans for carbon reduction as well. And so I will speak specifically about one of the ways that we have been already contributing to the development of new te technologies through the AI for Earth program. And so the AI for Earth program was started about um, two and a half years ago now um, and was focused on looking exactly at how it is that we're going to create a bridge across these two areas of environmental science um, and the challenges that we're facing in that sphere of being able to have the data and the analytics available to make decisions more quickly um, and all the uh, innovations that are happening in the computer science space. 
And the way that the AI for Earth program functions um, is we work on being able to increase access to cloud and AI technologies through a grants program, um, be able to provide the training for how to make maximum, take up maximum advantage um, of those tools. As you could imagine, not all environmental scientists are necessarily um, the, the most gifted um, in the computer science space. And so we're really looking at that skill share and transfer. Mm -hmm. Um, and finally, how can we look at fueling innovation? There's some really strategic ways um, of partnering with Microsoft Research, um, Microsoft Data Scientist, um, and looking at working hand in hand with some of these key organizations in the environmental space. Um, so to date, so we've now given more than 500 grants um, with impact in more than 80 countries um, around the world. And we're really looking at how to work on scaling innovation across the entire technology stack. And so what I mean by this is that in order to really be able to create some of these necessary environmental tools, um, we do need to be able to build out the right building blocks at each one of the steps. And so again, to be able to create some of these innovative AI approaches, you really need to have access to curated data sets that are properly labeled and maintained um, over time. And so we're looking at how it is that we could help with that data curation and also make some of these key data sets, um, such as geospatial monitoring data sets, um, available easily on the cloud so that it's very easy to be able to utilize, share, et cetera, um, and be able to all build off of that foundational data. Um, what are the right infrastructural pieces to build out to, again, help with the sharing of the work more easily? Um, how can we train the right algorithms so that they're key tool sets needed by the environmental community and deploy them as APIs so that they're easily accessible and could be components of key environmental applications? And how can we help host those key environmental applications on the Microsoft Azure Cloud so that they'll be more easily scalable from region to region across the globe. And what we really are working towards is this overall, what we're starting to call a planetary computer. And so what we see again is that we really do need to have this one central platform that's con um, connecting those who are contributing to the data and the analytical tools and those who are going to be able to consume and use them and to make sure that they're going to be able to be building and using and working on the same platform, communicating needs and communicating new um, new insights as quickly as possible. And so you'll see, um, not, to, not to, per, <laughs> to give you a little bit of a sneak peek, uh, Microsoft will be making um, an announcement um, this week around some of the ways that we're going to be making additional progress on building out this planetary computer. And so I also did want to give you a little bit more of an idea of some of the projects um, that we've we've completed to date. Um, and again, as you could imagine, I could, with more than 500 projects, I could keep speaking about them um, all day. So if you're ever curious about any specific areas, please do feel free to get in contact with me. I'm going to share just two of my favorites today. Um, and so as you could imagine, um, I started out um, sharing a story of how I was working on sustainable fisheries um, research in Myanmar. So this is an area that's really close to my heart. Um, 60, more than 60% of our oceans are already fully fished. 30% are already overfished. Only really 10% left are, are still fishable. Um, and it's something that, uh, especially in some of the uh, developing areas around the world, which are incredibly reliant on fish, fishery sources um, for their main nutrition, it's um, becoming really catastrophic um, for these local communities as well. And so we're really excited to work with an organization called Ocean Mind. Um, and I'm actually going to have a switch over to the video now so you guys could get a little bit of an intro video to learn more about what they do. It's amazing how much humans take from the sea. Costa Rica is 92% oceans. We wanted to be sustainable. 
illegal fisheries are a great threat. it's having an impact in our oceans and in our economy and in our environment. there is many issues with sourcing sustainable seafood. we are trying to push for that accountability on the water. narrator using microsoft ai, we empower governments, suppliers and ngos at scale around the world to prevent illegal fishing in a way that just wasn't possible before. at ocean mind, we receive billions of data points. satellite images, optical imagery, radar imagery, infrared data. we use microsoft ai to recognize different types of fishing activity, the identity of the vessel and whether that vessel had a license. we find the suspicious activities so that our analysts can look and investigate it and governments can enforce more effectively. Now we have data, we can identify vessels, we can identify patterns of illegal fishery and support the Coast Guard. The ability to have third party verification is crucial in protecting us and our brand as we sell seafood throughout the world. We are making our first API available through Microsoft AI for Earth to anyone who wants to help fight illegal fishing. The time for taking care of the oceans is now. We have the capabilities to change the needle on the sustainability of fishing. I am convinced that we will make a difference. Fantastic. So it looks like we lost Bonnie for a second. We will get her back. But one of the things I wanted to say about the video that she just did was that the, the fundamental problem of overfishing is a problem of lack of property rights. Um, and so uh, you don't have problems like this, like overfishing with uh, cattle or other things like that because you have the property rights. What the AI allows um governments and other organizations to do is to get control of the property rights so that you don't have what's called a tragedy of the commons so this is a fundamentally free market problem because you don't have enforceable property rights um, and so technology is allowing us to uh, control for these sorts of things um, <clears throat> and solve a problem that governments simply were not able to which is why you saw um, such a high percentage um, of those uh, fisheries were already overfished. So Bonnie, I was just explaining why AI is so important in dealing with overfishing because there aren't enforceable property rights and how that's helping. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I absolutely love this because again, as you can imagine across such a large area of the oceans, it's incredibly hard to be able to track vessel to vessel and be able to actually try to do that monitoring to determine whether or not illegal fishing is happening at all. And regardless of whether or not good policies are being put in place um, to try to prevent illegal fishing, it's going to, without that proper enforcement, um, it's going to be impossible to actually keep on track to meet sustainable goals. And so the work that Ocean Mind is doing um, in coordination with a number of different um, countries around the world, helping directly with their enforcement agencies, as well as on the business side and thinking about, um, especially as consumers are getting a little bit wiser um, and demanding sustainable um, fish um, fish um, and sustainable catch um, as part of their um, procurement of food, it's going to be able to have that traceability um, back to um, each catch and whether or not it was coming off of a vessel that was doing things properly. Um, having that information is going to be able to make such a big difference. And so I'm going to go back and hopefully share my screen again. If that's going to pop up. Oh, perfect. Here we go. All righty. We should hopefully be back on track. Um, Perfect. 
And so the next example that I wanted to chat with you about um, is an organization called Sylvia Terra. And they are a startup um, based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, this is what happens when it was a computer science student um, and a forestry student um, who met at Yale uh, and there, there's sort of the, the the byproduct of their friendship um, is the startup that's really focused on, um, as we just talked about Ocean Mind, what is possible when you're able to do that level of monitoring, um, be able to get very precise down to every vessel in the sea. They're doing this terrestrially on land with every single tree. Um, and so they were able to um, leverage AI and remote sensing technology to be able to create the first map of every single tree in the continental US down to its identified species to its diameter and its height. Um, and so this was ended up being processing more than 537 million acres um, of, of land. That's more than 800 terabytes of imagery. Um, and this was being done at 10 times the speed of any, um, any previous compute efforts. And ultimately, they were able to be able to identify more than 90 billion trees. And so as you can imagine, being able to have access to that first layer, that like data, that data layer, what they're calling um, the Sylvia Terra um, base map of every tree in the US, um, that's the sort of data that we've never been able to have access before and is able to unlock a ton of different um, capabilities. So you can imagine everything from being able to monitor forest ecosystems, um, to be able to better do prediction of wildfire risk um, and things like that. Um, the specific use case I'll chat with you guys about now um, is they were able to, Sylvia Terra was able to partner with the Nature Conservancy um, to work in um, Pennsylvania to think about how it is we could actually help um, engage smallholder farmers, um, smallholder landowners, smallholder forestry owners, um, in actually entering the carbon market. So as you can imagine, um, the way that carbon markets usually work, those who actually are able to offer offset credits are these very large forestry projects. Um, and it just takes, again, a ton of investment to be able to actually do that level of verification um, in order to, again, offer valid credits on the market. And so smaller forestry owners have historically been shut out of this because being able to do that level of investment is just incredibly difficult um, to do. And so they're really their, their way of being able to um, make uh, make money off of their um, their forests is really cutting it down and offering it to timber companies. So we're thinking about, well, if we actually have this technology available that's able to mo do, do tree by tree monitoring much more cheaply and much more quickly than ever before, what sorts of possibilities could that actually open up? Um, and so Sylvia Terra was able to work with um, Pennsylvania forestry owners on um, being able to leverage their technology to be able to provide um, the, the calculation Calculations on the estimates of how much um, their the, how much carbon potential keeping their forest standing was work, worth, um, and we're able to pilot that and have these new offset credits available. And Microsoft was the first to actually purchase those as part of our own commitment. Um, to being able to be carbon neutral and now carbon negative. And so it's a really good example, I think, of thinking about how it is that some of these technologies that we're investing in are able to unlock new source, sorts of data, new analytical potentials, new insights, um, and be able to actually tie that into new decision, into new actions that are possible on the part of the forestry owners to actually have um, a financial incentive to keep their forest standing um, and ways for um, corporations and others in the car in the offset market to actually make those purchases. And so I think in summary, um, hope, hopefully you come away uh, from hearing about some of the work that we've doing, um, that it's really clear that there's a big opportunity um, for technology to be able to play a role. Um, the way that big data um, with big compute applied to it is going to be able to unlock new insights um, that will actually um, allow us to make some strides um, towards these big environmental challenges that we're facing. And so um, us, we, we at Microsoft and we at AI for Earth are really excited to think about some of the roles that we could start playing to help support these solutions. Um, and we'll be really focused um, in the coming years on how it is that we continue to scale these solutions and make them widely accessible to the public. 
Um, and so with that, um, I will be more than happy to stay on the line and help answer some of the questions from any of the attendees. That was great. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, so if you have a question, go to the chat box and type in the question, um, and then we will have uh, somebody uh, choose them and read them out for us. But before we get started, I just wanted to ask you a question, uh, Bonnie, get us started, which is that when people talk about environmental problems and especially climate change, people uh, may be concerned about the risk, but they also are concerned about the cost um, and, and the expansion of government, which a lot of folks uh, on the right who have concerns about climate change are also worried about those things. And I want you to talk a little bit about um, how technology can reduce the costs of achieving those environmental goals so that we're not having to make a trade-off between the environment uh, and the economy. And I'll just give you a quick example. Um, you talked about the APIs um, and what an API is, if you don't know, just for computer programmers, it's a, it's a box where essentially a computer programming black box where programmers can send a request for data and then the API calculates it and then sends it back. There's a great example over in the UK where there's a company called Octopus, which is a utility which has variable prices. And when during peak demand, when electricity is the highest, they charge much more but they've published an API and there are people now who are using that API. One guy created a, um, an app for your phone that shows you when you should turn on your clothes dryer and other things so that you get the cheapest rates. And that API allows them to get real-time information to make those sorts of decisions. And APIs can obviously help um, people who are on the ground who don't have a lot of money. One of the beauties of the market is, is that companies like Microsoft can make the money to be to address climate change in their carbon footprint. But you know, your work in Myanmar, I'm sure, is very different, where you don't have a lot of resources, and driving down the cost of environmental help is really important. So talk a little bit about how technology and the work that you're doing can open that opportunity and reduce the cost of helping the environment. Yeah, that's exactly right. And as you can imagine, coming from the nonprofit space um, into a large corporation like Microsoft, we're talking about very different levels of resource availability, right? And in order for us to be able to work towards this overall sustainable future for our planet, we need to be able to get to the point where people at all different resource levels, organizations at all different resource levels, are going to be able to all work towards making the decisions um, that will lead to a more sustainable future. And so one way that I think about this is that ultimately um, for us to get to more environmentally sustainable actions, um, what we really need to do is to be able to do that optimization piece um, as uh, as effectively as possible. Like we're, we're talking about, it's, it's overall this resource optimization problem where we have a limited amount of natural resources. We cannot um, exceed the usage of them above a certain threshold um, above which our planet will be out of sync and out of whack. Um, and so how is, how is it that we could work towards being able to optimize those usage, the usage of these limited resources um, in a way that we have a hope of uh, a sustainable future. And so working on that optimization problem um, is that piece that technology really has a role to play um, because a lot of the things that, um, that previously went into being able to do that are costly, time-consuming um, processes around monitoring as one example, right? Having to actually go out and be able to track every single tree. Um, that grows in an area is something that takes a lot of time resources and takes a lot of cost um, to be able to do and to be able to do that consistently um, over time um, and on a time frame and quickly enough that we could actually be making the right decisions is going to be essentially um, not, not feasible. And so thinking really about the ways that technology will be able to help hit upon the right sorts of um, shortcuts so that we have a, a chance of being able to do the right sorts of data curation and analytical pulling out the right insights, the right and analytical insights, um, that's going to be incredibly key. And I think that other, the other half to that that's really important is thinking about what are the right ways to do that um, dissemination, um, to do that sharing across. And so I think that's another piece where I think um, 
us at Microsoft, we at Microsoft are really aware of the fact that we have um, access to certain technological features. We have access to resources that not everyone does. Um, and so some of the most costly first steps are really on that research investment, are really on that first development piece. Um, but there are ways that we could think about um, how to do that scaling um, how to be able to bring in more people, whether it's our customers and our partners um, around the world, then that's going to be that way that we could actually be able to share that out more broadly um, at much, much, much lower cost than in the net new development and creation. And so I think that's really core to what we're doing at AI for Earth and in our work on the planetary computer is the idea that we're not um, we're not expecting and we definitely don't want to have just a lot of independent efforts putting in lots of resources to do net new creation. It's really about how to bring people to the same platform so that we could share our resources and work together towards developing um, these key tools that are necessary. Yeah, that's great. So uh, let's go to David Bose, who is looking at our questions. Dave, do we have any questions? Lots of questions, Todd. Um, thanks so much. Representative Matt Bonke has a question. Ocean mine sounds amazing. My concern and question is how are they tracking the individual boats, the fishermen, the fish, and is this a data privacy issue? And a follow up, how are they monitoring when illegal fishermen will just turn off their GPS? Is there a way to track this illegal fishing without intruding on their personal privacy? Fantastic question. Um, and yeah, to, check, to chat a little bit more about um, what exactly ocean mine is. Um, what they're using um, is a combination of a couple of different data sources. And so there is information um, directly on some of the vessels, um, especially on the legal vessels who are doing things um, correctly, that transmit um, location information. Um, and that's one, one of their data streams that they pull in. Another piece that they are pulling in is also remotely sensed imagery. So you could imagine the satellite imagery from overhead. Um, that is all sort of um, publicly accessible, available information um, from a number of different large geospatial data providers, both governmental as well as some of the, um, the private providers. Um, and being able to, the, the tricky part is previously, right, it's like you have this vast store of geospatial information, being able to actually pick out um, specific things uh, on land or in the water is very, very difficult. And they've worked on creating some algorithms to be able to specifically pick out vessels and vessel types. Um, and they have a number of algorithms that essentially are able to pick out and try to determine, is this vessel type it occurring in an area of the water where it makes sense and where it should be, is it moving in a way that is um, that is again um, indicative of illegal behavior, or is it moving in a way that seems to be that is engaging in illegal fishing? And so a lot of those. Um, those predictive measures are really focused on, again, like all of the legal purposes will be filtered out, and it's specifically on the actors that seem to be behaving in erratic ways um, that are um, picked out um, in this in this imagery. Next That's question. Um, I'm sorry, Todd, did you want to address that as well? Or? Go ahead. Next question. Uh, regarding Microsoft's goal to become carbon negative by 2030, can you talk a little bit more about how Microsoft is planning on achieving this? More specifically, is it mostly through entering the carbon markets or through other technologies? Absolutely. Great question. And so uh, as a part of that, as you can imagine, we have both short term as well as longer term plans um, to already start try to meet those goals. Um, we, we do need to start acting immediately now in the short term and in, um, in investing in what is already available on the market. And so as you can imagine, a lot of that is going to be what is currently available in the carbon offset market um, in, in really short term it's going to be a lot of different natural climate solutions that we could work on helping accelerate um, and increasing purchase of um, so again short term really focused on what is possible now and how it is that we could already immediately um, make moves towards increasing um, the the types of offsets that we've done um, in the past um, in the sort of the middle to long term um, especially through that climate innovation fund that we've put together we're starting to do the investments in some of these novel technologies that don't already exist yet 
because again, we think that it's the expansion of the types of technology such as direct air carbon capture um, that are going to have um, great potential as well. But they're currently at a level that's um, not really available and the costs are too high. Um, and so we're looking at what are some of the ways that we could invest in the right players um, who are doing um, really interesting work to be able to help make some of these technologies uh, more available. And hopefully there's some of our investments ultimately bring the cost down to a level where um, others would be able to um, participate as well. One of the things that I love about that is you talked about the cost of doing that. So one of the things that I stressed early was is that <clears throat> uh, politicians are not always accountable for the expenditures that they make. And in Washington state, we unfortunately don't set a standard for how we reduce CO2 emissions. And so we subsidize things like rooftop solar and Western Washington is one of the worst places. We did a calculation that subsidizing rooftop solar in Western Washington cost about $1,600 to reduce one metric ton of CO2, whereas the market rate is between $7 to $10. So that's one of the things I love about market approaches and what Microsoft is doing is that they're trying to get the most bang for the buck for every dollar. You don't always see that um, with political solutions. So Dave, let's ask our next question. Sure, this is from a viewer, well, say initials, JC. Um, they have a question they fear is a dumb question. Uh, they they want to know, are there plants which consume large amounts of CO2 that we could cultivate in a large number, gardens on top of buildings, things besides large plots of, of undeveloped land? Yeah, and there's never a dumb question. That's actually a great question. Um, and the answer is absolutely. Um, there's different species of plants, different species of trees um, that are uh, that are able to take out more carbon um, from from the atmosphere. And I think uh, I think that hits upon a really interesting point, which is, a, again, going to that fact about optimization, um, when there's a lot of different reforestation or afforestation projects, um, the, picking out the right species to be planting is actually um, a key component. Um, and in each different geography, the best optimal species actually is different. Um, and so uh, being able to work with the right technologies to actually be able to pick out what is the right species and what is the right species blend to be planting um, that would be, again, contributing to the native ecosystems in the area to be able to help maximize um, in carbon um, carbon capture. Um, there's like a, a ton of different factors with carbon capture being one component, ecosystem restoration, um, native um, habitat restoration, um, things like that, all of those being factors to help with the selection of what are the right things to plant. And, in, and we actually see that in, in Washington state, in Western Washington, hemlock, dug fir are the primary species that you want. In Eastern Washington, it's ponderosa pine. And actually the, the second part of that is, is that the University of Washington has really interesting research talking about how you maximize carbon sequestration in forests over time. And one of the ways that you do that is you allow a tr uh, forest to grow rapidly. And then you harvest that forest and sequester it in the form of buildings. Um, and we have great technology now with what's called cross laminated timber where you can build taller and taller buildings out of wood that holds that carbon and sequesters it in a very energy efficient way. And then you replant and you start that process again so that you are constantly having forests growing at very high rates, uh, sequestering a lot of carbon rather than just letting a forest sit and then stop growing. Once it stops growing, it stops bringing in the carbon. And so the University of Washington's done really nice work showing that if you have those forests growing rapidly and that you harvest them and turn them into buildings, you can maximize the amount of CO2. I think we have time for one or two more questions, Dave. Yes. Um, are there any opportunities for Microsoft to help dairies accelerate carbon sequestration projects? Sorry, can you say that again to help who with carbon uh, sequestration dairy, projects? Dairy farms. Um, oh, dairy are, farms. Yeah, are there any opportunities for Microsoft to help dairies or dairy farms accelerate carbon sequestration projects? Yeah, actually, absolutely great question. Um, we do have um, a couple of dairy farm projects um, among the 500 that we've been supporting to date. Um, there's some really interesting work um, doing essentially better cattle tracking um, and being able to help with their health, um, being able to have a better understanding of their diets um, and what they are emitting at their back ends um, and being able to, to work at, look at ways to be able to, to help with that. Um, 
to, to sort of expand on that, we also do a lot of work um, in the agricultural space um, in general, really widely, so not just dairy farm specific necessarily. Um, agriculture is one of the focus areas of AI for Earth, um, and we've worked with a lot of interesting um, projects that are looking at precision agriculture to look at um, um, more precise irrigation measures, um, to look at ways to improve and increase yield with various optimization algorithms. Um, so lots of interesting work in the agriculture space in general. So this will be the final question, um, Todd. Yep, what, applic what applications do you have for the transportation sector, which contributes 40% of greenhouse gases? Absolutely. Another great question. Um, we could also chat more about this offline as well. Um, we definitely do have um, transportation projects that we've supported as well, um, looking at more efficient routing. Um, of there's, there's a really interesting startup that does um, really efficient routing of public transportation mechanisms to think about ways to, um, to do that and allocate um, that resource in a way that's going to be, again, more efficient and more effective. Um, so I think, again, going back to that theme of optimization is really thinking about how it is that with the fewest amount of um, resources put out, we could service the most amount of people. Um, and so we definitely have some um, projects in that space. I will mention um, that uh, for the AI for Earth program specifically, we do focus our work on four different areas of agriculture, water, biodiversity, and climate change. Um, and climate change being an all-encompassing one, but really focused a lot on climate modeling, um, weather patterns, and things like that. Um, and there's other parts of the company that do a little bit more work on things such as energy efficiency, transportation, sustainable cities development, and things like that. So a lot of richness of work in some of the other corners of Microsoft. Well, this has been really good. Thank you so much, Fani, for joining us. I think that's this is exactly why I wanted to have you on and talk about AI for Earth. As I said, um, having worked in public policy for about two decades on the environment, um, politicians do the best they can with the tools they have, but innovators create new tools, and that is exactly what you're doing, and I think it's going to really make a difference uh, for the environment. So that wraps up uh, this part of the program. Uh, we're going to take a short break now. Um, on your screens, you'll see some of the sponsors that have made uh, this program possible, as well as a WPC policy video. So you can get up and uh, stretch for a few minutes, and then when you come, we come back, we will be with Dr. Roger Stark, who will leave the conversation about free market solutions to healthcare reform. Uh, thanks again, Bonnie, and thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. A pleasure being with you guys today. Good morning, and welcome to this, the first uh, virtual solution summit for Washington Policy Center. I am Roger Stark. I'm the healthcare policy analyst at uh, Washington Policy Center, and I'm a retired physician. Uh, we're going to talk this morning about uh, solutions, free market solutions, as far as healthcare reform is concerned. Our featured speaker was to be Sally Pipes. Sally is the CEO and president of Pacific Research Institute in California. And like all good Californians, she is self-distancing and she is at home. Unfortunately for Sally, she is located on the end of a cul-de-sac and her Wi-Fi and her reception is very spotty. Although it worked last week, we're having technical difficulties this morning. I can guarantee you at some future date, we will have Sally do a presentation for our Solution Summit uh, in, in the uh, future. Also with me today, uh, we have a very distinguished guest, uh, John Graham, who is the District 10 uh, Director for the United States Health and Human Services uh, Department. Uh, John comes from a think tank background, however. He uh, was an analyst at the Pacific Research Institute and worked with Sally Pipes uh, quite uh, extensively. So I'd like to turn this over to John right now to give us an update on what is going on with the uh, Department of Health and Human Services as we fight this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, John. Thank you very much, Dr. Stark. Thank you. And um, I'm so glad to be able to join you all at the Washington Policy Center Solution Summit this year. Oh, so a different lifetime when I was in the think tanks, I was invited to be a guest speaker and we used to meet in person. Those were the days, glory days. Uh, I'm so glad we have the use of technology to, uh, to be a substitute and you know, next year and in future years, I hope to be able to join you again in person. Um, uh, I, don't, so I don't think I'm supposed to say this publicly, but Dr. Stark called me a few minutes ago and said, uh, 
uh, Sally Pipes can't make it. Can you wing it? So uh, I said, I'll do my best. You know, there's only one person in the administration who's allowed to wing it, and I'm not him. So I'll do my best to represent the president and the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the next few minutes. I'm sorry I won't be able to take questions from the participants in the conference, but uh, those of you who want to track me down, I'm easy to track down. Uh, my phone number and my uh, email address are, are, are easily discoverable at the hhs.gov website. And my role in the region, Region 10, it sounds a little spooky, sounds science, science fiction-y. Uh, it includes Washington as well as Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska. My office is here in Seattle. And uh, my job is to represent Secretary Alex Azar in the region. I'm the only presidential personnel appointed in the region in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Other government departments do have presidential personnel. Uh, for example, Jeff McMorris uh, is the regional administrator for HUD, Housing and Urban Development, uh, and other departments do have similar positions. But there's only one presidential personnel in the region for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and that's me, and it's been me for about two years. And it's just a, a real pleasure to travel and meet stakeholders. Uh, I know you got some state legislators on this conference. I'm looking forward to meeting you. Uh, you're part of my stakeholders. Private businesses are my stakeholders. Uh, anyone who has a nurse in healthcare is a stakeholder. So don't don't be afraid to get a hold of me and communicate your concerns and ideas about what the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is doing. Uh, we have a number of priorities that the president wanted to achieve uh, when he got elected in the 2016 election. Uh, defeating COVID-19 was not one of them. So you're not hearing a lot from us about anything else than COVID-19 right now. So I'll spend a few minutes talking about our COVID-19 response, especially as it pertains to Region 10 and, and Washington State. So as you know, the president uh, has a plan, the 30-day plan uh, to uh, overcome this uh, coronavirus emergency. It was the 15-day plan uh, originally, and then it extended to a 30-day plan. It's largely driven on good practices of personal hygiene, washing your hands, uh, doing all the kind of normal things you would do uh, to reduce the risk of contracting influenza. It also includes uh, the social distancing or physical distancing, uh, which is uh, actually enforced by law in, in Washington state and many jurisdictions within Washington state. state. So the president and, and the governor and the other local officials were on the same line uh, in terms of practicing good hygiene, uh, keeping social distancing. The president, as you know, does not want to do this longer than necessary. We want to reopen the country up as, as soon as we responsibly can, uh, get businesses back to work, get employees back to work, get the recovery going. Uh, we're working very closely with states uh, to get the supplies they need, the testing kits, uh, things that like swabs, that you have nasal pharyngeal swabs to get the swab, to go into the test, to get the sample into the test, things like that are in short supply. Uh, personal protective equipment, gowns, gloves, masks, working very hard with the states to get those, uh, get those delivered to the places that need it, hospitals, nursing homes. Uh, some of you might have seen community-based testing sites uh, or drive-through testing sites. Uh, they've popped up somewhere in some places around the state and in some places we've been supporting them. Our COVID-19 response uh, is actually not led by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It's led by FEMA, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Organization, uh, which is uh, part of the Department of Homeland Security. And uh, the regional administrator for that department is a fellow called Mike O'Hare. Uh, he's also presidential personnel. He was actually came from Alaska. His office is in Bothell, and that's where the Regional Response Coordination Center is. And we have people in that FEMA Regional Response Coordination Center. Uh, you probably know, I hope you've heard that the president is getting along very well and the vice president is getting along very well with Governor Inslee. We're on, on the same track in terms of overcoming this uh, emergency and this crisis. Uh, we've done so well that you may have heard in Seattle, there was an Army Field Hospital setting up in CenturyLink uh, football stadium and we stood that down. You know, the state said we don't need that. And so uh, we, we managed to reach the peak uh, without as bad a crisis. I mean, like the president says, we can't put a to a positive spin on this, but we certainly didn't get the worst case scenario that we thought we might have had. And that's largely because of Americans and Washingtonians doing what our, our experts have advised us to do. Uh, stay at home if you feel sick. If you can telework, telework. Uh, don't 
do social engagements, just only go where, where it's necessary to go somewhere, I reduce the risk of communicating the virus to somebody else. Uh, and we still don't know, you know, I'm not a public health expert, but I spent a lot of time on the phone listening to them. You know, we, we a lot of us can have had the virus and, and not exhibit any symptoms, you know, so it's really, really important that we keep doing what we're doing uh, uh, in terms of keeping physically separate from each other. Uh, so we stood down that Army Field Hospital and it's going to go to another place in the United States. Uh, there was, uh, again, a, a proposal to set up with federal support uh, a surge site in Yakima and the state said, you know, we're not going to need, need that either. Not to say in sometime in the future we may not need it, but we're standing down the facility we're standing up in Yakima. So really in Washington state, we're doing very well on the COVID-19 uh, response. Um, I speak with Governor Inslee with some frequency. Uh, the president and vice president speak with him a lot. So we are able to put politics behind us on, on, on this front. I should also say that part of the, the response is uh, happening at the Food and Drug Administration, which is part of our department. Uh, a part of the department you might not have heard about called BARDA, B-A-R-D-A, -A, Biodefense, and I can't even get the acronym right, but it's kind of the venture capital part of our business, I shouldn't say business of our government department, uh, which actually can invest money in innovators to develop responses. So I was actually on the phone yesterday with a company in uh, Snoqualmie that thinks they have a design for a, a ventilator. You know, we need ventilators and innovative designs of ventilators. So I put them in touch with the folks at BARDA to uh, see if they can make progress on developing a ventilator, getting it to market really quickly and help decompress the, the ventilation requirements in the hospitals. Uh, the FDA has granted emergency use authorization for uh, various technologies from the, from the medical devices to uh, guidance on the personal protective equipment, the gowns and masks and gloves and stuff like that. Uh, and also on developing therapies and vaccines, which is a big priority. So we've got a lot of clinical trials going on uh, at uh, the medical centers in Washington. Uh, I don't want to name them because I, I can name one, but there's probably at least one other one. Uh, there's clinical trials going on, so I don't want to name one and, and sort of highlight them over the other one. But I think you all know what I'm thinking about, that we've got great academic uh, doctors and scientists uh, doing trials and developing uh, vaccines, and even companies. Uh, I, I guess I am allowed to name Microsoft because we had a Microsoft speaker before us. But you know, the big companies and small companies are all weighing in, and FEMA and us are spending a lot of time relating to those companies. Some of which were manufacturing things that you know were made of textile, and now they want to start making masks and gowns and gloves. Well, we, we want to help them to do that to get that production ramped up, and then at the more higher innovative side of things, people actually doing clinical trials or, or developing you know, artificial intelligence for surveillance that the CDC and public health can use to spread the track of the virus uh, as we progress. So a heck of a lot of things going on on the COVID-19 response. And I think in Washington state, we're doing really, really well. Now, once we get done with this, um, we will be back on track to focus on the things that the president said he wanted to get done when, uh, when he got elected. And one of them, of course, is affordable health insurance. Uh, as you know, uh, Obamacare led to a significant, like a doubling of premiums in the, in the individual health insurance market for uh, over the five years before uh, the president got elected. Uh, some people were protected by that from government subsidy, but some people who were close to the 400% uh, of the federal poverty limit line, they didn't get a subsidy, they re were really suffering as a result of the consequences of the premium hikes that came as a result of Obamacare. So we introduced a number of reforms, uh, as much as we could do by rulemaking. Uh, we can't solve all the problems of Obamacare. The president and secretary would say that quite bluntly, we cannot solve all the problems of Obamacare. Congress must act uh, to replace Obamacare with health insurance that works for everybody. But until that happens, uh, through rulemaking, we've expanded things like health reimbursement accounts, health savings accounts, association health plans, and some of those things, of course, the state insurance commissioners and state legislatures have a role in too. So uh, in some states, uh, and again, I am not allowed to make any comment on any state uh, law or policy or rule, so I will not, but uh, Washingtonians uh, who want full advantage of the flexibilities we've offered in the individual insurance market um, are feel free to address the state insurance commissioner and the state legislature and, and act to to do that and, and enjoy those full flexibilities. 
Another one is value-based reform uh, focused on Medicare. Um, we have a very successful reform in Medicare that goes back to the Bush administration, the Medicare Advantage plans. So Medicare offered by private uh, health insurers, private plans, uh, the Medicare for all crowd. Uh, I know that was what Sally Pipes was gonna speak to us all about was her, uh, she's written a book of course about uh, false promise, false premises, the title on Medicare for all. Uh, a number of folks in Congress have supported the Medicare for all bill uh, which was, I think, sponsored by uh, Congresswoman Jayapal, who's actually uh, my congresswoman. I'm her constituent in Queen Anne in Seattle. Uh, that this bill would outlaw all private health insurance. And uh, we don't think private health insurance, as it is currently structured, is perfect, but we certainly think it's better. Uh, the president thinks it's better than a, a private monop a monopoly of the government controlling all access to health insurance. So in fact, Medicare for all would destroy Medicare for current Medicare beneficiaries and people who are looking forward to Medicare uh, uh, when they turn 65, because it would eliminate that option of having the private Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, the president's executive order on Medicare directs us, directs the Secretary of Health and Human Services to make the traditional fee-for-service Medicare, which is a fixed price government system, look more like Medicare Advantage. And we're working on that in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, right now, we've got over a third of Medicare beneficiaries in Medicare Advantage plans. They're satisfied with them. and We want to keep that going. We don't want that to be uh, abolished by Medicare for all in the old 1960s version of Medicare. Another priority is uh, reducing uh, prescription drug prices. And the president's approach is not uh, just impose government price controls on uh, prescription drugs. We recognize the value of innovation. We want investors to keep investing in the pharmaceutical enterprise. I think right now we see that in the COVID-19. If we don't have incentives to develop vaccines or therapies for, the, for this virus, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. We can't go through the rest of our lives maintaining six, six feet of distance from each other and teleworking, right? So we need to get uh, therapies and vaccines, and, and that goes for all, all, all kinds of things. But you know the prices are out of control. And uh, so we are working in many ways. Uh, the president put out a blueprint for prescription drug price reform uh, back in uh, over a year ago now, a couple of years ago now, I think. And we're working on that. Again, a lot of that needs Congress's support. The president has supported what Senator Grassley has put forward. Uh, in his prescription drug pricing legislation. Uh, and we are very wary of what has come out of the House majority on just government price controls. That does not send a signal to investors and innovators the kind of innovation we want. So it's a complex problem and we are, uh, the president is committed to addressing it for the benefit of American patients. Um, the final one uh, of our four priorities is uh, the opioid epidemic. And uh, with this COVID-19, you know, as soon as we're done here, you're going to start hearing us uh, get back on, on the opioid epidemic really heavy because uh, there's been so much innovation. We had a reduction in overdose deaths for the first time in many years last year, uh, real success in medication-assisted treatment, uh, treating the people suffering from opioid use disorder as patients, and uh, that everybody who wants healing from this addiction should be available to access it. Um, we are now in the grip of the COVID-19 epidemic. We've offered a lot of flexibility for telehealth, for access to medication-assisted treatment, uh, prescribing buprenorphine and Suboxone remotely. And that has, you know, the, the, the Drug Enforcement Administration has a role to play in that, Substance Abuse and the Health Services Administration has a place to play in that. But rest assured, uh, for those of you who are living in communities ravaged by the uh, opioid epidemic, that we are, our, our, our eye is not off the ball of that one. We're continuing to survey and focus on that. And although you're not quite hearing a lot about it now, uh, we're still focused on it. And we know that in the COVID-19 epidemic, in this situation where our ability to be physically close to people is so limited, that those people trying to get out of opioid uh, use disorder, uh, they are at risk. And so we are doing everything we can to ensure they get the diagnosis and treatment they need. I think that's about it, Dr. Stark. I think I've done as best as I can uh, without overly having prepared. And I hope I don't get, I hope this doesn't hit CNN or MSNBC and I get, I get tweeted about, but I'm just so grateful to be able to talk to, I should give a shout out to the Washington Policy Center. 
you know, uh, once we're in the government, uh, our ability to do things is, is uh, well, we do the best we can, but, you know, we're, 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 we're employees of the federal government and the federal government has its, uh, it's a great opportunity to work in the federal government. It also has its limits. And we very much value the work of the Washington Policy Center and the other think tanks. Um, when, rest assured, those of you who are um, fans of the Washington Policy Center and supporters of the Washington Policy Center, that your uh, your investment is 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 uh, is well invested, and that uh, that we take the policy proposals of the think tanks, including the Washington Policy Center, very seriously, and it has an impact. So I will close my remarks, Dr. Stark. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Thanks, John. And thanks for um, all you do uh, at the federal government level. Um, we appreciated your work when you were in the policy world and, and now uh, appreciate your work uh, working in within the government. And thanks for the uh, great summary of what's going on at the uh, federal level. Thank you. So, um, so obviously what we've been working on at the Policy Center for the last six to eight weeks is the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, this is the most important issue that faces the country right now as far as healthcare is concerned. Um, we've been following this whole issue locally and nationally, and uh, John gave you a, an update basically on what the federal government is, is doing. Also, um, I'm going to go over some things. Um, free market healthcare reform ideas, things that we we have supported down through the years. If you do have questions of me, please write them in the chat box uh, next to the screen. Uh, David Bowes will then uh, sort those through and, and uh, I'll answer, take some time and answer some of your questions uh, in the time that we have left. We also at uh, Washington Policy Center have set up a resource, a COVID-19 resource site, and that includes not only healthcare, but also includes the environment, education, small business, of course, uh, agriculture. All of our center directors have contributed to this resource site, and it's on our website. Please access that and get the, get the updates on what's going on here locally. Now, you might say, so, okay, we're in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis. Healthcare reform, is it really that important? We got to get through this crisis. And the answer to that, of course, is yes. Uh, the, once the crisis is done, we're still facing uh, what, what really is a, a major crisis as far as healthcare uh, in general is concerned. Uh, last year, we spent about $3.5 trillion on healthcare. That represents about 18% of our economy. And at the current rate we're spending, above and beyond the viral crisis that we're in now, at the rate we're spending now, there's some predictions that by the late 2020s, 2030, we will be spending 30% of our economy on healthcare. Now that's nonsensical, basically. There's absolutely no way from an economic standpoint we can spend that much. So something has to be done as far as healthcare reform is concerned. Obviously, there are two ways to go. We could introduce more government control or we could introduce more patient control. And of course, at Washington Policy Center, we strongly believe that patients are the most important part of the healthcare equation. Now, the one thing that this COVID-19 crisis has done is it has actually played into the hands of free market uh, advocates. And what I mean by that is, as, as John mentioned, we're seeing an increased use of telemedicine or telehealth. This is tremendous. It decreased costs and it increased access for patients. And this sort of happened organically. It wasn't by a lot of legislation. It was by patient needs. And, uh, and again, this has been a tremendous thing that we have seen over the last four to six weeks. We have also seen that certificate of need laws are really not that important. Uh, Washington is one of the few states that still has certificate of need laws. If you want to build a new hospital, if you want to add intensive care unit beds, you need a C of N in the state of Washington. And what we have seen, again, over the last four to six weeks, organically, is that no one seems to need C of Ns to build hospitals, to add intensive care unit beds. Uh, and, and we think, again, that's a free market solution that is just happening spontaneously. The next thing, of course, is uh, providers. We need more doctors. We need more nurses. Um, Washington State is facing a shortage just like the, the, the country is. 
And again, what we have seen with this uh, COVID-19 crisis is we have seen a relaxation of licensing, both intra and interstate in our area. That gets more doctors, more nurses into our area to take care of these COVID-19 patients. And again, this is this has gone outside of any legislation. This has just happened simply because of the need the, um, and, and the necessity with all of these sick COVID-19 patients. Now, let me insert a shameless plug here. I have author, uh, authored uh, several books down through the years, and we are about to release my latest book. Um, it is not a policy book per se. It is a book for the average uh, the average American to read. You can't see this on the screen very well. But it's healthcare policy sim simplified, understanding the complex issue. And we're going to have a book release next month. The book should be available on our website. And it goes over many of the things that, that we're uh, discussing right now. Free market solutions and why more government is not the way to go. Now, just briefly, let's go over some other things that we have not seen but we would like to see, and John alluded to some of these. Uh, first of all, insurance reform, health care insurance reform. The current administration has done a lot as far as uh, providing uh, more insurance options for the public, especially young adults, young healthy adults, 18 to 36 years old. And if we're going to make any progress on uh, reforming healthcare, putting it more in the free market, we're going to need more of this insurance reform going forward. Say what you want about the insurance industry, but they're absolutely necessary. I think automobile, think homeowner insurance, uh, health insurance can provide the same kind of things as long as we relax some of the regulations and we allow the industry to provide the kind of products that patients can use and want and need. So that's number one. Number two is price transparency. This is critically important. We discuss this quite a bit in my new book. If you're going to be um, an active consumer of healthcare, you absolutely need to know what prices are so you can be a savvy shopper for health care. Uh, this is critically important. Uh, it, can you imagine going into a grocery store and not knowing what the price of milk is or the price of bread or the price of the hamburger? There's no way that you can uh, that you can shop in an intelligent fashion without knowing prices. And that's one of the most critical things as far as health care reform is concerned. We don't believe that that needs government interaction. We believe, again, that should be a groundswell sort of thing. And providers, hospitals, doctors should compete not only on quality, but also on price. Fundamentally, to get where we need to be with healthcare reform and putting the patient in, in control, we need to eliminate the third party payer system. And historically, this is, uh, this is, been in our part of our natural environment in this country for the last 70 or 80 years. It started during World War II um, in the mid 1940s. <clears throat> Employers got involved in uh, in sponsoring and paying for health care. That model has persisted down through the years, such that half of all Americans now have employer paid, employer sponsored health benefits. We need uh, to allow individuals to take that same tax break that employers are taking and use that individually. Um, allow them to use their own dollars, allow them to, to seek their own insurance and in a, in a free and competitive market and get away from the employer-sponsored health insurance. The other third party payer, of course, is the government. And we need a meaningful Medicare and Medicaid reform going forward. We need meaningful Obamacare reform if we're going to keep that, uh, that program intact. So those are some of the kinds of things that we need to do as, um, as a nation to eliminate uh, government and, again, put patients back in control. Now, one of the concerns that we have is the, with, uh, with more government intervention as far as the COVID-19 crisis is concerned, we may see some of those things uh, persist and some of those things lasting even after the crisis is, uh, is gone. 
So we're going to monitor that very closely. I, I know myself uh, at a local, national, state level, and also other think tanks around the nation are going to be looking at this very, very carefully to, to say, okay, we needed government to beat the COVID-19 crisis, but we don't need any more government now. We need patients back in control and back, uh, back in charge of their own health care. Now, with that, let me uh, turn it over to questions. If you have any, that would be terrific, and um, and I'd be happy to take questions now. Thanks, Dr. Stark. People can ask questions by emailing me, dbows at washingtonpolicy.org, or just uh, more simply, use the chat function, the question function, right there on your screen on the right-hand side. It's part of your go-to meeting or go-to-webinar toolbox. First question uh, do you see the Wuhan virus outbreak changing the FDA approval process? Last I read, it costs $1.4 billion to bring a drug to market, which is likely amortized in the cost of prescription drugs once they are approved. That's a question from viewer Chris. Yeah, I... I I, I think we will. I, one of the one of the problems that we had early on in this crisis is the the control that the FDA had over uh, testing, for example, uh, testing for the COVID-19 virus. And I think there is is going to be major review in the Food and Drug Administration. Um, I think we're going to need uh, to 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 uh, bring prices down for all medications. I think we're going to need uh, streamlining of the FDA process. And so, yeah, it, that's a good question. And, and I think absolutely going forward, we're going to we're going to see some kind of reform there at the FDA. From viewer Daniel, uh, if a certificate of need isn't a big factor, then why in Kitsap County would it require a competitor to ask a current hospital for beds? How is that free market? Um, well, if I understand the question correctly, uh, it, it, uh, a certificate of need is a government process to expand beds or to build new beds, if you will. I think with the COVID-19 crisis, um, necessity is sort of the mother of invention. And, and what we're seeing are institutions doing what they need to do to take care of their patient load, whether they're asking other institutions to take some of their patients, whether they're shifting uh, ventilators from one hospital to another. Uh, I, I think that's that's what we're seeing simply because of the crisis, simply because we need to, to handle this patient load. Here's a, a two-part question from Kay. Uh, the first um, part deals with uh, the presentation of COVID-19 news. The question is, why are virtually all COVID-19 charts the public sees cumulative? A cumulative chart can never go down by definition. If you look at actual daily death tracking chart in Washington State, we are way down. Why can't we ever see actual numbers folded into overall flu deaths for perspective? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, and uh, there are some experts, national experts, who say do not look at a day-to-day, 24-hour -day, kind of uh, number. Look at a three-day, at least a three-day running tally, and you can, you can get a much better idea, a much better impression of what's, what's actually going on uh, in real time, if you will. Um, you, you, we hear that for certain communities, say New York, for example, the number of cases is, is still way up. But if you look um, over the last three or four days, the number of deaths that they've had has actually plateaued off. So looking at an individual day really is not that helpful. It's got to be a running tally, um, essentially. There's a question. Uh, why is there no work being done on things like vitamins, herbs, and homeopathics? Um, vaccines are not good. Are vaccines going to be mandatory in any way? Well, I don't know if vaccines are going to be mandatory, but I think what we've seen here is that, uh, especially, for example, last year uh, with the measles crisis, uh, with, without having vaccines, we, we know that, that viruses can just take off. Um, there are many virologists out there, people who study these kinds of things, who who really put 100% of their faith in vaccines to to actually be part of the solution here for the COVID-19 crisis. Now, why we're not seeing other healthcare kinds of um, um, things like uh, vitamins and so forth, I think those have always been part of the armamentarium. They're not part of formal training um, in medical school. 
uh, for most medical schools anyway, uh, but but they certainly have a place in the overall treatment of uh, of ill patients and wellness for that example for for that matter. Yes. I'm going to combine two questions based on price transparency. Um, how do you see price transparency happening without government? And um, is price transparency being coupled with medical outcome transparency so we can become better informed medical shoppers? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I think um, as as patients spend more of their own money, they are going to demand uh, price transparency. Um, there, there's of course the example of LASIK surgery uh, for eye correction, and that is a total free market. It doesn't involve insurance. It simply involves patients paying cash. And what we have seen over the last 10 or 15 years is the price of LASIK surgery has has dropped dramatically. Now, uh, with high deductible insurance plans, I think we're going to start seeing more of that. Patients are going to demand it. And I think we can do that and work through that without having government in, um, intervention and government saying, yeah, you absolutely have to have to show prices. That patients, uh, again, as consumers, are going to demand that. And then they, what was the second part of that question? Uh, question? Um, it was... Uh Gosh, I don't have it on the screen anymore here, Dr. Stark. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. We'll just have to move move forward. Um, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Dan. It's all right. Do you think the uh, business healthcare tax break actually increases healthcare costs and diverts money away from wage salary increases? Um, say that again. I, I I didn't catch the first part of that. Yeah. Do you think that the business healthcare tax break actually increases healthcare costs and diverts money? away from wage and salary increases. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, there's no question about that, right? Um, you bet. If somebody else is paying for a service or a product, we are going to use as much as we can of that product or of that service. So, sure, as, as employers have paid for these benefits down through the years, uh, patients use them and and um, use use more than they actually actually would if they were paying out of pocket, if they were paying for their own costs. Um, that's like an economic principle, basically. So again, we, we become much savvier shoppers if we were spending, shoppers for healthcare, if we were spending our own, own dollars. Yeah, you bet. Is a market-based healthcare system, in a market-based healthcare system, how do people who don't, don't have money ever get healthcare? Well, there is a role, uh, a role for government. There's, there's absolutely no question about this. Um, if, if you are a low-income individual, um, if you're transitioning between jobs or something like that, yeah, there, there's a role for government. Uh, Medicaid, when it began, was a safety net, basically, for children uh, and their families uh, of, that had low income and some disabled uh, individuals as well. Uh, we have gotten way away from that with the Medicaid program, but it it, the idea of a safety net is is actually extremely valuable. So if individuals don't have the money to, to afford their own insurance, they um, th th there needs to be a program like Medicaid in place. Now a corollary there is Medicaid should not be an end sort of product. In other words, if you go on to Medicaid, it should be simply as a temporary thing while you're working to get a job, getting back into the, into the, the job market, and then transitioning into private insurance. So there is a role for government. Don't don't get us wrong, but but it's it's not to provide health care for everyone. And let me also say along those lines, I think uh, Sally Pipes was going to mention Medicare for All and the COVID-19 crisis. And what people need to understand is that with Medicare for All, a single-payer system, those countries that have a single-payer now are basically tapped out. They are using all of their health care dollars to provide basic routine kind of care. And you put uh, superimpose upon that a COVID-19 crisis, and what they're finding is they're way short of ventilators, way short of ICU beds, um, way short of, of uh, providers to take care of these sick individuals. Now, you can look at a country like South Korea, for example. They have a, a government-controlled system. But they approach this COVID-19 virus much differently than a number of other um, 
um, industrialized countries. They did early testing. They were very extremely active with, uh, with self-distancing early on in this crisis. And so consequently, they, uh, they didn't have the huge imposition on their existing healthcare system that we're seeing in Great Britain, for example, in Italy, for example, Spain, and so forth. What can we do as a free market, um, free market private citizens to reduce American obesity? It now appears as though that is the greatest mortality risk regarding the virus. That is a really good question, and that, that boils down to personal responsibility and everybody taking control of themselves. Um, uh, obesity is it's, it's another crisis in this country. I, the last statistics I saw, 80% of Americans are overweight and a third of Americans are morbidly obese, and, and that is just not acceptable. Now, if you, you, you could say, well, what can we do as a country? Um, and, and there really is no role there. I mean, what, you want to eliminate sugary drinks or ice cream, or uh, that, that really is not the role of government. And I think it's up to every individual to accept personal responsibility. Now, again, another corollary there is that should, are, are we all responsible if we had a single payer system, are we all responsible for taking care of these people who um, who overindulge or who ride motorcycles without helmets or who skydive or do these these dangerous kind of activities? And the answer to that question is no. We're, we're we should not be responsible for these, these high risk activities. And clearly, obesity is is one of them. Dr. Stark, this has got to be the final question because uh, we're about uh, due for the next break. Do you think the current environment will change the state Democrats' uh, drive for single payer in the state, as well as the state long-term care program? Um, un unfortunately, I don't. I, I think that uh, when the dust settles on the COVID-19 crisis, we're, we're going to be back where we were. There's still going to be uh, a, a certain percent of the population that's going to be demanding single payer kind of system. Um, I, I think the liberal left will want will want to uh, take up that um, that drumbeat again, unfortunately. So I think uh, we have to be vigilant. We have to really push our agenda, our free market, our patient control agenda, and uh, really make sure that our voices are heard here. So that was the last question, folks. Uh, we're going to take another five minute uh, break. Um, we want to thank our sponsors. Uh, I want to thank John Graham again for, for being on and sharing um, the federal update with us. Um, also, because of the COVID-19 crisis, obviously it impacts healthcare. It also impacts our economy. And our next panel is going to deal with this specifically. Jason Mercier, uh, our government reform uh, director, is going to lead this discussion where specifically they're going to talk about no income tax in Washington state. And again, thank you so much for attending this morning, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, the next sessions. Thank you. Welcome back to the 2020 Solution Summit with Jason Mercier, Director of our Center for Government Reform. Great, thank you, Dave. I'm Jason Mercier, the Government Reform Director. In this next hour, we're going to be talking about Washington's competitive advantage of no income taxes. But before we're joined by our panel, just want to remind you that if you have questions, to go to the GoWebinar chat function and put them in there, and we'll go through those questions at the end of our presentations. But I want to give you a little update at first about what we've been working on in the Center for Government Reform, in particular related to the COVID-19 situation and what it means for the state's employers. With the governor's stay home, stay healthy directive essentially shutting down many employers, we've been calling on the governor and state lawmakers to totally waive state tax liability for those businesses that have been shut down by the government and have those tax liabilities away from the point of the emergency proclamation to at least 30 days after this situation has been resolved. It's very important to provide this liquidity for those employers so there are actual jobs for people to come back to so we can start to try to get back to normal. The other thing we've been working on is with the Secretary of State on how to facilitate our constitutional right of initiative and referendum in an era of a stay home directive. How do we gather signatures? So the Secretary of State has got some recommendations for that, and we have details on both her ideas as well as our call to waive the tax liability for employers on our COVID-19 page at WashingtonPolicy.org. But of course, 
we continue our efforts to try to educate and stop the games being played in the legislature on the capital gains income tax. And I say that deliberately because we know it is in fact a capital gains income tax and not an excise tax. And I'm gonna go ahead and try to share with you why this is in fact the case from our department of, uh, excuse me, from the IRS who answered this question directly. And hopefully you can see on your screen this image from the IRS to my Congressman Representative Newhouse answering directly what type of tax is a capital gains tax? Is it an excise tax? Is it an income tax? And you can see here in no uncertain terms, it is an income tax. Capital gains are income. And we know that every other state in the country treats them the same because I personally contacted the revenue director of all 50 states and they all told me the same thing. Capital gains are income. So why is this game being played right now in the legislature? Well, to help answer this question, I sent a records request and I've already received 6,000 pages of emails from the legislature. And in particular on your screen right now, you'll see one from one of the proponents of this effort, Senator Jamie Peterson. And this is in response to somebody who is advocating for an income tax. But I wanna call your attention to that second paragraph. And you'll see there the true motivation of this is to try to set up a lawsuit to see if they can get five judges on our state Supreme Court to do something that Washingtonians have consistently rejected. And that is to change the constitutional restriction on a graduated income tax to say that you don't own your income, it is not property. And that way the legislature with a simple majority vote can impose an across the board graduated income tax. Now that is part of the legislation effort there and to bring us this, but that legal fight is down the road. To talk about the current legal fight and some very exciting news on what our state Supreme Court just did, I'd like to bring on our first panelist, former Attorney General Rob McKenna, who played an important role in protecting Washington's competitive advantage of no income tax, to share an update on what the state Supreme Court just did in the Seattle income tax case as well as what it means going forward for a state income tax, a local income tax, and this possible litigation down the road on a capital gains tax. At this time, I'd like to welcome Rob to give us the update on what happened. Great. Jason, thank you very much, and thanks for uh, putting the summit together. Even to have this opportunity to provide a briefing on the income tax case. A little bit of deep background or long historical background. A Washington State voters approved that statewide income tax uh, in 1932, but in 1933, the voters, uh, I should say the Supreme Court, invalidated the income tax that had been adopted because it violated an earlier constitutional amendment which defines property under the Washington State Constitution as everything tangible and intangible subject to ownership. So again, the Washington Constitution as amended by the voters in 1930 says that property is everything tangible or intangible subject to ownership. In 1933, the Supreme Court opined that that definition of property is just about as broad as you could possibly imagine, and that it encompasses income, since income is an intangible that we all own. We own our own incomes. So in 1933, they struck down the statewide progressive income tax, and in a series of decisions since 1933, the Washington Supreme Court uh, has continued to give effect to the plain meaning of the Constitution in that regard. There have been 10 efforts since then that you and the Washington Policy Center have documented very, very well uh, to adopt the state income tax. Six times this has been done by uh, moving a constitutional amendment through the Washington State Legislature. That's a big lift, as you all know. To amend the state constitution requires two thirds of the state house and two thirds of the state senate to approve the amendment. It then has to go to the voters who must approve it by a majority vote. Six times that's been attempted and it's failed every time. The voters have rejected it. Four other times, 
uh, income tax measures have been moved to the Washington state ballot without uh, a constitutional amendment, apparently because, uh, as was the case in the year 2010, when Initiative 1098 was on the ballot, the measure sponsors hoped that if they got the voters to approve it, somehow the state Supreme Court would uh, reconsider its earlier decisions and approve a progressive income tax just because the voters approved it. But of course, that's never happened. So 10 times Washington voters have said no uh, to uh, an income tax for the state. And they've done that uh, by, by wide margins. In 1983, the state legislature adopted a statute which prohibits city and county income taxes, just as plainly prohibits uh, income taxes uh, by local governments. But none of this prevented the, uh, the left from uh, advocating for, continuing to advocate for uh, a graduated income tax. A couple of years ago, well, probably about four years ago now, uh, they made an effort to create a test case by trying to persuade the city of Olympia to adopt a city income tax in that city, an effort that failed with the city council, so it went to the city ballot. That effort also failed when voters turned down a city of Olympia income tax. And then they brought their effort to the city of Seattle. The city of Seattle's council was more obliging, and they adopted a city of Seattle income tax that's graduated uh, to create a test case. They were pretty open about what they were trying to do. They were trying to create a test case that would eventually reach the state Supreme Court uh, and would result, in, they hoped, in the Supreme Court reversing over 80 years of its own precedence and ignoring the plain language of the state constitution to find that income is not your property after all, and therefore is not subject to uh, property tax limitations. So that test case was uh, generated by uh, the uh, city of Seattle. Uh, we filed a lawsuit along with lawyers for two other groups of plaintiffs, mostly uh, small business owners, elderly uh, individuals who became the plaintiffs. And the Superior Court of King County invalidated the city of Seattle income tax on the grounds that it, it uh, number one, uh, violates the state statute prohibiting city income taxes. And number two, because uh, under state law, local governments have to be expressly authorized to impose any tax that they, uh, that they try to impose. In other words, uh, a city or a county has to have authority from the state in order to impose any particular taxes. They lacked that authority. And of course, they faced a statute which says no city income taxes. The city appealed that case up to the state Supreme Court, which declined to review it directly and sent it to the Court of Appeals instead. The Intermediate Court of Appeals in Division One in King County heard the case, uh, and they upheld the court of they upheld the Superior Court's ruling by uh, in, in invalidating the city income tax by finding that it was unconstitutional. So unlike the Superior Court, which never reached the constitutional question because it could decide based on statutory questions, which is exactly what courts are supposed to do, decide based on statute, avoid the constitutional issue if you can. Unlike the Superior Court, the Court of Appeals uh, did get to the constitutional question. They said that they were bound by the uh, Supreme Court's precedents that found that graduated income taxes are unconstitutional. So they struck down the city income tax as well. However, along the way, and as part of their decision, the Court of Appeals invalidated the 1983 statute, which prohibits city and county income taxes, uh, ruling that it violated, that, that the bill which enacted that law violated the single subject rule because the bill addressed several issues involving cities and counties. So they did that uh, to, to open the door, we thought, we think, to uh, a Supreme Court uh, ruling on the constitutional question involved. But the Supreme Court declined to accept review after we won in the Court of Appeals and won in the Superior Court. The Supreme Court declined to grant review after the Court of Appeals uh, had issued its opinion, leaving the Court of Appeals decision in place, which means that the city of Seattle's progressive or graduated income tax uh, is unconstitutional, it's done, it's over. But it also means that the Court of Appeals ruling that the statute prohibiting city and county income taxes uh, is uh, no longer valid, which uh, you know allows the city to adopt an income tax that follows the rules for property taxes, which means that they can adopt an income tax of up to 1% that's uniform. 
That means that just like property can't be taxed at non-uniform rates, any tax on income has to be uniform. You can't have a graduated tax and it's subject to the 1% per year limit on property taxes. Now, this is actually in concept uh, always been a possibility for cities and counties, but for the state statute, which was adopted in 1983, and but for the lack of authority for cities and counties to adopt any income tax. It had never been authorized by uh, the state to do that. The Court of Appeals found a way around that as well uh, in, in some reasoning that I won't bother to go into now. But it really raises this question. It's like, you know, does a city that claims that the problem is regressive taxation, or is it really going to adopt a flat income tax that would not just be a quote unquote tax on the rich, but would have to apply to everybody at the same rate, up to 1%? Are they really going to do that? Uh, the implication uh, is that they won't in the sense that it doesn't do anything to address their, their claims of regressivity. It would apply to everybody. It would be unpopular. Uh, and it would be just a naked grab for more revenue. So we'll see if the city of Seattle actually follows through. The mayor has said she's interested in a flat income tax, uh, but we'll see whether or not the you know political blowback uh, is really worth it. It would, of course, be subject to a city referendum if it passed. And I predict that if it were adopted, it would be wildly unpopular since it would apply to everybody. It would be uniform and would not achieve the holy grail of progressive politics in the state of enacting a progressive income tax for the entire state. So with that, Jason, uh, I'll pause and answer any questions you have and otherwise, uh, you know, kick it to the next uh, panelist. Great. Well, thank you very much, Rob. And a reminder, if you do have questions, you go to the GoWebinar chat function there and we will answer all of those after our panel is done and Rob hit the legality of where we stand but there's the important economics and believe it or not folks are trying to take advantage of the current COVID-19 situation to say this is the perfect time for Washington to impose not only a capital gains income tax but a broader income tax saying somehow it will help balance our budget it will help sort of solve the problems that we're facing and to talk about the economics of income taxes and sales taxes and the volatility of those during an economic downturn. I'm happy to welcome my go-to source for information at the national level, Jared Walzak, who is the Director of State Tax Policy at the Tax Foundation. Jared, thanks for joining us this morning. It's good to be with you. Well, uh, thanks for having me here. Um, we'll transition a little. I'm going to get a slideshow going here in just a moment, but um, want to talk a little about what an income tax would mean in a time like this, what it is meaning in um, certain states, and what we expect in both a normal recession and the very unusual recession that we're experiencing right now. Um, and if you'll give me one second, I am moving over to um, the screen and Hopefully you can all now see a slideshow presentation because I cannot. Um, but essentially during a recession, we normally see income taxes as much more volatile than almost any other form of tax revenue. And this sort of makes sense, right? Because income, to, income is going to change, adjusted gross income, which is the basis for most state income taxes, is going to change significantly more uh, because a lot of people are both seeing reductions in their income but also seeing changes in the sources of their income, especially as unemployment rises and individuals move towards receiving government benefits. Consumption is generally going to decline significantly less than income. One, because if people see their income decline a little, they will still be probably consuming about the same amount. Consumption doesn't decline that much. Two, if the source of income claim changes and there's no taxable income, they're still, of course, uh, consuming, and this is still often subject to the sales tax. Uh, there's another aspect with income taxes, which is namely that you see significant capital losses in a time like this, any recession really. But in uh, in the Great Recession and in 2001, we saw uh, capital gains realizations slide 71 percent in their worst year, 43 percent in the next worst year. Uh, people are experiencing capital losses, not capital gains during those years. So you get to a position where especially if you just have a capital gains income tax there's basically no revenue in a year like this but even with a broader income tax you expect significant portions of the revenue to be gone 
hopefully you can all see my screen right now and you should be able to see a slide that shows the volatility of state tax collections during the Great Recession. And what you can see is the general sales taxes didn't move that much. At their absolute worst, they dropped 8% from their Great Recession pre-Great Recession peak. And that's a lot, but it's pretty manageable for states. And you can see that that's better than the total taxes average. Income taxes dropped much more. Individual income taxes dipped about 16%. Corporate income taxes, by the way, dipped 25%. And they did that because uh, on corporate income, you can ultimately have essentially no taxable income. You can have actual losses. Individuals would not generally experience that. They do have capital losses, but most individuals will still have income. Many corporations do not have income. So this is a huge challenge with any sort of income tax. And the recovery also takes significantly longer. After a recession, you usually get back to normal on consumption very quickly. You don't get back to normal on income for some time. Uh, moving on to another slide that shows a very similar thing. This is just what income and consumption themselves, not the tax revenue, but the actual measures of income and consumption look like during the Great Recession. What's notable here, adjusted gross income, which is the federal starting point for your income and is most states starting point for your income, dropped even much more precipitously than personal income itself. And again, this is partially because people are shifting from taxable forms of income, uh, like, uh, like you know, your regular wage income towards a, uh, an income stream that might be supplemented by government or has declined in such a way that uh, less of it is above tax thresholds. And it takes a long time to recover. It's more volatile. In the great years, you see this really zooming. You see the growth as it recovered. And because that is uh, annualized growth rates, it doesn't mean that personal income was generating a ton more after the Great Recession. It's just that it recovered. And you, know, you can see that you know, ultimately personal consumption was quite flat throughout this. Now, I do need to put a major caveat on this, which is that we're not experiencing a regular recession. We're experiencing a recession that is uh, you know, ultimately being largely driven by stay-at-home orders. And these are necessary. These are part of the public health circumstances we have right now. But this changes our consumption patterns in ways that normally a recession does not. And I can show this on the next slide. This is from The Economist. This is a decline in consumption across some major categories. So obviously, anything associated with tourism is uh, just completely tanking air travel, uh, restaurants, uh, things like that. But even most of our normal consumption is declining. And here is general merchandise, uh, just a general uh, decline in sales. You can see that we are down 30% year over year. Now, hopefully that will not last for the long term, but this is a significant impact on sales taxes as well. So this is an unusual recession. We are seeing sales tax revenues decline very precipitously in a way they don't usually during a recession, but income taxes are doing the same thing, if not more so, and capital gains in particular would have an especially um, deep decline. What's even more important is what the recovery looks like. If we were able to get back to normal in maybe a month or two, and we all hope that that's where we'll be, we'll be maybe not solve the crisis, but at least some of us get back into regular workspaces, you would expect to see consumption pick up pretty quickly. You would expect to see a lot of businesses getting back to business, um, and therefore sales taxes should rebound. Income taxes will take much longer to rebound as people find their way back into the economy and are still dealing with all the losses that they incurred during this time. Now, there's a huge uncertainty here. If we end up in a virtual lockdown for many, many months, then sales taxes may not perform any better than income taxes. And that's just a very unusual circumstance that we haven't dealt with before. But when you're planning, you're planning for this crisis, but also the next crisis. And what we know is that income taxes increase your volatility. Sales taxes are your stable tax revenue. Uh, property taxes at the local level are also a very stable form of revenue. In fact, they're more stable than sales taxes this time around because your assessments are not changing any in this particular year, whereas, of course, uh, sales consumption is going down at least temporarily. But you want taxes that can recover quickly. You want taxes that um, largely are going to be more recession proof, even if this is an unusual recession. And you really don't want to be tying so much of your revenue, as some states do, to sources of income that are extremely volatile, like capital gains. And no state has just a capital gains income tax, as is often proposed in Washington, but many states, most states, uh, do tax capital gains through their regular income tax. And they have precautions because of this, where when you have excess capital gains, they set them aside. 
because they recognize the capital gains income and capital losses are so incredibly volatile that you have to smooth it in some way. To have that as a standalone tax, especially right now, uh, would do the state no good. It would be penalizing what little investment to income there is, making it harder to recover without doing much of anything to uh, recover the, uh, the revenues here. So um, with that, I can be glad to take any, um, any questions. I do see that some people can't see the PowerPoint and I do apologize for that. I, I don't know how to fix that, but uh, yeah, hopefully some of you saw it. Great, well, thank you very much, Jared. And we will get to questions here after our final panelists. So again, if you have questions, please go to the GoToWebinar chat function there. So we've hit the legality, we've hit the economics, and we previously mentioned that no income tax is a competitive advantage for Washington. That's something our Department of Commerce says as they market the state to employers across the country and the world. But what does it actually mean on the ground to a state employer? And to talk about it, that with us today, I'd like to introduce CEO and managing partner of Tayo Pacific Partners, Brian Hayward, to talk about why no income tax is a competitive advantage for his particular business in Washington as a whole. Brian, thanks for joining us. Great. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to try to put up a, a whoops, put up a uh, PowerPoint here so I can explain it as well. I moved to I moved to Washington about ten years ago, and I wanted to give just a brief introduction, kind of um, I guess uh, as you said, where the where the um, rubber hits the road and how how taxes impact decision making. Uh, my background briefly is that I lived in Japan. For about 13 years, uh, sorry, uh, moved and then uh, moved to California in 2000 uh, at the at sort of the peak, the very tippy peak of the dot com bubble, when everyone was excited and creating a new business and uh, California was seen as the land of golden opportunity. And I moved back to Japan and formed a hedge fund business uh, with a couple of partners, and uh, that's kind of where we thought we were going to be for the rest of our lives. And uh, we were um, uh, fairly successful we, with our fund. We raised uh, almost uh, about two and a half billion dollars and uh, began to make some decent money. And then <clears throat> we noticed that the state of California was taking an enormous amount of it. And in fact, uh, one of the things uh, that really hammered us was uh, we we did an estimate. If you look at um, if you run your own business. Not only do you pay your own Social Security, but you have to match it, and, and essentially you pay double Social Security, and then and Medicare, and you also uh, double it. Uh, you double that of all of your employees, and so you have uh, sort of a, a hidden tax that's there. And then on top of that, uh, you had 13.5% uh, income tax that we were paying in California. And so my partners and I began to look around and and. Um, in 2010, we uh, we became economic refugees and decided to move to Washington. Um, but if I if I step back from that for just a moment, in about 2007, 2008, uh, several a couple of years before we moved, we saw this train was coming that just the taxes kept going up, and every year they were voting in California, can we add a one percent tax here? And then they would add a they would add a millionaire's tax that would start hitting people. At first, it hit them at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And then it would move down and it would hit them at you know a hundred thousand dollars. <throat> so we began to look at um, how do we what what do we do and and you can move or you can shut down or you can fight it and one of the things that uh, I sort of tiptoed into was uh, does it make sense for me to get involved in politics? And so I began to talk to uh, political consultants and my big complaint was that the taxes were so crazy in California that people were going to move. And at the time, uh, this this quote, nobody's going to move away from California. The weather's too nice. And I remember thinking, well, watch me. Um, and I think we were a couple of years before the big exodus. Uh, 2019 uh, is the year that marks seven years in a row of more people leaving California that are then are actually moving there. And uh, that means about 2012, this this net uh, exodus began happening. And we uh, fortunately got out in 2010. What's interesting is why are they leaving? Uh, the three main reasons given for leaving California, one is housing is expensive uh, and property taxes there are, even with Prop 13, prop, houses expensive and property taxes are high. Taxes was number two at 58%. And number three was cost of living. So 
in 2010, uh, we said to all of our employees, we had about 40 families that, uh, 40 um, employees, but therefore 40 families. Uh, we went to them and said, we're going to move to Washington. We did a, a bunch of research. We looked at all the no tax states. We looked at Texas and we looked at Nevada and um, the East Coast was kind of too far away from us because we have to fly to Japan. Uh, but uh, we decided, well, Washington state seems nice and <laughs> I'd never been here. Uh, but it had zero income tax. And so it was uh, with the Seattle airport and no income tax, it went immediately to number one on our list. And as we came and visited, we, we sort of fell in love with the state. We fell in love with the tax um, regime and, and told all of our employees, this is what we're going to do. And that we would then uh, subsidize them. We would help uh, pay for everybody to move up here with us. And what we were worried about is that our, you know, we would, we, we, we kind of prepped everybody and most people were um, on board with the idea. We were worried that we would lose our admins, but it turned out that all of our admins actually convinced their spouses to uh, relocate with us to Washington and get a job up here. So we moved 40 families up here. Within the first 18 months, we had uh, more than um, uh, covered our cost with the savings. And then uh, let me give you some more sort of the impact, the, the real physical impact, because for me personally, the first thing is uh, when I moved up here, the reason I've got a picture, if you can see it, of the horses is I bought a 40 acre horse ranch in Redmond. Uh, I also then for the next, well, seven, and actually it's now it's been 10, but for the next seven years, I didn't have to pay an income tax in California. And with the, just the California portion of taxes that I didn't have to pay, uh, it completely paid off my ranch, right? So for me, Personally, I, I kind of feel like I got this ranch for free because I moved here to Washington. That's a huge incentive. And I think for my employees, probably it's anywhere from seven to 12 years, they're paying off their houses because they don't have to pay income taxes in, um, in California. Uh, the second piece I'd bring up is that when I, when I moved here, uh, th this middle company, Tile Pacific Partners is my primary business. But with the ranch, I, uh, I began a, um, horse boarding business, uh, taking care of other people's horses. And so I've got, I kind of have three businesses that are here in Washington that we brought with us or brought or created. Uh, the first one is this horse boarding business. And I employ five to 10 full and part-time employees to take care of the horses and clean the stalls, um, take the horses in and out. Uh, my own company, I've got 40 plus full-time employees. Uh, and then one of the companies we're invested in in Japan is a company called Roland who makes the musical instruments, the digital drums and keyboards and synthesizers and and uh, all the fun sounds of the 80s uh, that you knew. Uh, and as we were working with them, uh, we we convinced them to create uh, a Roland cloud business and that Seattle was actually the, the prime location that they should set up this business because of the technicians and the location and, and the taxes, et cetera. And so Roland uh, set up a business in Seattle with now they've got 20 to 30 depending on the time and the projects, 20 to 30 full and part-time techs and marketing professionals who are uh, putting out Rolling Cloud. So we've, we've brought um, more employment to the state rather other than just kind of, this is just sort of in, in a way, just my impact in the, in the, in the, in the state. Um, by the low income tax, I, I have brought three more businesses, which is about 80 people's worth of employment. And then I went back and we calculated uh, payroll for these different businesses. And since we've moved here to Washington, uh, we've contributed about a hundred million dollars in payroll to uh, Washingtonians, to people actually living here in Washington. We estimate that our employees have purchased about $40 million in homes. And um, this is a, a rough estimate, but uh, we suspect that uh, they've probably paid about $4 million in property taxes over the, the time that we've been here. So uh, if I can conclude, um, it does have an impact and I would end with uh, just say no to the income tax. I'll Great, turn it back to Brian. And at this time, I'd like to welcome Brian, Rob and Jared back. So David Bowes can direct to the particular panelists any questions that we have from our audience. David, are we ready for questions? Sure are, uh, Jason, thank you. The first question comes via email from Stephen. He wants to know, it says value added taxes exist throughout most of the world and occasionally come into US conversations. How does a VAT tax react to economic cycles? Jared, would you like to take that one? 
Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, the value added tax is going to respond uh, somewhat similarly to what we see in consumption taxes right now. If we had a VAT in this country, it would be in substantial decline as well in the current crisis. In most recessions, it would be far more stable than you would experience with income taxes or most other forms of taxation. Also important to note, because uh, Washington, of course, has a gross receipts tax, the B&O, that often these things are conflated. People think, well, the VAT is imposed at every stage of production, so is a gross receipts tax. They're the same. They are not. What you have, unfortunately, is considerably worse. A VAT's not a bad tax, in all things considered. It is imposed at every stage of production, but only on the incremental increase in the value. So by the time it gets to a final consumer as a good or service, as the total amount is taxed. It's like a sales tax on absolutely everything consumed, uh, just taxed along the way. Whereas with the gross receipts tax at pyramids, where the same value gets taxed over and over again. Next question Would a state tax on share buybacks make more sense? Perhaps progressives would give concessions on public sector unions in return. <laughs> Ryan or Jared, either you'd like to take that? I don't think any tax makes sense. So I, that's I'm I'm very biased on that. I don't think a share buyback tax makes a lot of sense. It it appeals in a very populist way, um, but a lot of these people are um, shareholders. Like like the average person now that has a, a decent amount of their money in 401k plans, and the share buybacks. I know it's a controversial uh, populist topic right now, but I don't. Um, I would prefer the federal government didn't give money actually just to begin with, but uh, taxing share. Um, share buybacks uh, doesn't tax the companies, it taxes the shareholders, which taxes the 401k holders, which is the your that's your retirement income. So I don't think it's a great idea. Jason, uh, what is the status of Washington's rainy day fund and how many months can it cover the reduced sales tax and other revenue? Yeah, so this is a, a great point to Jared's presentation. There is no recession proof tax structure. Every tax scheme has volatility. Washington actually ranks pretty well because we do rely on three fairly stable taxes, the property, the gross receipts, and the sales. But you are going to have a downturn, and we are going to feel, as Jared pointed out, the pain from the current situation, which is where you weather this through fiscal discipline in your base budgets and having a strong reserve account. Now, we have just under, if you combine the ending fund balance and the constitutionally protected reserve account that the voters adopted a few years ago, just under about $3 billion to help us with this current situation. Now, it's a pretty good size reserve. It should be larger, and it would have been larger if we didn't see the budget get increased during the supplemental year. Thankfully, the governor did issue significant vetoes to try to bring down that spending and have the ending fund balance be a little bit larger. But if you combine that roughly $3 billion reserve with what we're seeing in some of the relief funds from the federal government, we should be able to weather a short disruption. If we're looking at another month, it's gonna get tight, but if this extends further into summer, then you're gonna to start to see that reserve account basically get eaten up by this current economic climate and, and significant changes in state policy will have to happen. I will note this is why you're likely going to see a special session at some point, because the, le the governor cannot access those reserves, only the legislature can disperse them. And that's probably what will happen if you see a special session. Uh, Jason, this question is uh, for Rob McKenna from uh, uh, a viewer named Victor. Does flat mean the elimination of a threshold below which is excluded and above which is uniform? That is that is a great question, and the answer should be yes, because what you effectively do if you don't apply the income tax until someone hits a certain level of income in Seattle it was $250,000, is that you have two rates, a 0% rate for anyone earning less than $250,000. And uh, I think in Seattle it was a, two, a little over 2.5% rate for people earning $250,000 or more. So you have two different rates, therefore it's not uniform, and therefore it's unconstitutional. Uh, just stop and think about what it would be like if property taxes didn't apply to the first $250,000 of your property's value. It would obviously mean you would have differential rates, which aren't allowed under the Constitution. This is a question for Brian. Would a 1% uniform income tax rate in Washington state be enough to make you move again? 
Uh, maybe, or maybe I'll run for office. I don't know. Um, uh, one percent. It it seems like it's not a lot. Um, that doesn't. But uh, the B and O tax is is onerous on a business, and so you're going to get hit one way or the other. If you started creeping in, my my fear would be once you open that door, you don't stop at one percent. It moves to two, then it's five, and then it's six, and then it's eight, um, and you'd you'd creep up very quickly. And so uh, I'm going to run my business. Um, uh, in the mo I, I can move. I can move capital. I'd prefer not to move again. I really actually love this state. It's been it's been great for us. But um, if the one percent started and started moving, yeah, I, I would uh, I would definitely look at moving again. I can because our my my employees uh, can work from anywhere. Jason, this next question is: Does the state of Washington use uh, static scoring like the feds do for estimating the cost of proposed legislation? Is there any chance of moving to that? If not. Yeah, there have actually been several proposals over the years to go to dynamic fiscal modes, which basically take into account you're going to have a change in behavior for a certain either tax policy or spending policy. Right now, we are still using a static model, and that's partly uh, a bit of a head scratcher. When you see the projections for these capital gains income tax bills, those project stable revenue growth as far as you can see, which we just know is not economic reality. So especially on tax policy, you would like to see more dynamic scoring introduced but it does create a little more uncertainty on, on the modeling, but at least it's a little more honest way to look at the changes in economic behavior. If I can be add that quickly, um, I think there's been a secondary problem with the scoring of uh, capital gains uh, income in which really they are just looking at good years or they're looking for, at average years. I mean, even a static score um, would ideally be capturing the variance, but the problem is that's not how scoring is. As static or dynamic, usually you're looking at a stable state economy, so you're not really looking at the fluctuations. You are looking at what if the economy stayed constant, how would this happen? Uh, dynamic doesn't solve that problem. What dynamic will help you do, though, is catch the feedback effects. How does the tax itself change behavior? And this is very hard for states to do. Um, really, the only states that even make a significant effort at it that I know of are Oregon and Minnesota. Um, and I think they both do a very good job, but it's not terribly common. Uh, it's something that more states should probably do. But even if you move to dynamic scoring, you're not going to see the enormous swings, the volatility in capital gains income taxes showing up that will absolutely exist. Brian, are your employees still employed? And uh, Jason, how many state employees are still on full salary? Yeah, all mine are. Because um, my, 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 uh, of the several businesses, all of my employees uh, at Tayo can work from home. Uh, we're all virtual. Uh, on the horse boarding business, I got to take care of the horses. So that's if we don't feed and clean the stalls, uh, that's so there I'm keeping them on board. Um, uh, the and then the rolling cloud business, I believe, is all still they're working from home. So we're sort of fortunate. Um, we're un, unlike I like luckily I'm not in cons, in local construction, right, where you get they've just been hammered, um, which I, I think is really unfair. Uh, in the state, but I, I'm really fortunate that I can. Um, I feel for the blue collar um, and the the food trades that just are just getting slammed by this. And, and Dave, to your question for me, the governor issued an unprecedented 147 line on, uh, vetoes in the supplemental budget. So they know there is going to be some impact on state finances, but we don't know what that is yet. In a couple of weeks, we're going to get the very first monthly tax collection report that's going to fully reflect everything that happened over the past 30 days. So at that point, the state and local governments will be able to kind of forecast out how big of a hit they're going to be taking. So you haven't seen any local or state reductions in employment yet. Some have taken action requesting freezes in salary increases or even some reduction in salary. But with a heavily unionized state and local workforce, almost all of those actions require reopening their contracts. So to date, nothing has happened yet but there will be changes coming down the road. And this has to be our, our last question for your panel, Jason. Uh, this comes from a person who describes himself as not a huge fan of income taxes, but they say it can certainly be less regressive since most of the wealthy don't voluntarily give their money to the needy. Can Brian tell us what he's done to help people who ordinarily would be helped by government funds, homeless, mentally ill, et cetera? And he states that uh, he believes that if we're going to oppose an income tax, we have to show other ways we can address need. Sure. Um, I, 
I'm sort of, I don't want to uh, just kind of broadcast all the things, the, I mean, that even sounds brag. I, I mean, this is one of those things where if you say, this is what I do, you sound braggy, and if you don't do it, then you're a, you're a jerk. Um, I, one of the things I do on my ranch is uh, I hire a lot of, um, of young men um, kind of in between college and, and high school. Um, I hire more than I need, if I can say it that way. Uh, so I, I sort of uh, run my ranch at a deficit and have been for a while because um, there's sometimes with the, especially with the minimum wage, uh, the high minimum wage in Washington, that 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 group that doesn't have a specific skill or a college degree yet, they have a hard time getting a job because uh, they've been priced out of the market. Uh, you can you can buy a college degree uh, person um, for the for the same price that you get sort of day labor, right? And and so there's sort of a, a goofy thing there. And so I've I've always sort of hired more. Um, I I actually am involved. Uh, I give well over 10% of my income to charitable and philanthropic uh, ventures. Uh, and then, uh, I, you know, there's private things that when people are in need, um, uh, I'm, I have a, my wife and I uh, feel uh, very blessed and, and try to be generous with what we've got. Uh, it's not something I want to put out there and say, oh, hey, this is what I've done, but um, we're involved in it. And, and in fact, I think that's a big misperception, um, if I can address the, the nature of the question. I, the people, that, so I, I, um, I've done well. And I've got I've got money, and we've we've sort of made that a shameful thing almost. Oh my gosh, you're a terrible person because you have money. Uh, but I and so my friends uh, are also terrible shameful people. And when we when we talk together, um, there is a common theme, which is how how can you how can you best help other people? And it's not that sounds I I don't know how to do like it's it's something that people think about. What can I do that for good with what I've been given? And it's not, it's it's more common than you would expect, and it's way more common than I think is the perception in the market that people that have been uh, financially fortunate feel a deep obligation to do something. They just don't want the government to come with a gun to their head and and make them do something that's usually stupid and inefficient. And uh, so I, I am very involved in it and feel a deep. For me, it's a very moral obligation. Uh, I didn't grow up with. Uh, money at all. We, we grew up very, very poor. And so I'm aware of it and active and, and feel a, an obligation both um, uh, morally and, and uh, divinely, I guess, uh, if, if you can even put it that way. Well, thank you, Brian, Jared, and Rob for joining us, giving us an update on the legality. Rob, I'm happy to see you on the screen now. Those are the most brilliant legal and <laughs> Regal legal advice I've ever heard by seeing myself on the screen. So, and Brian, thanks for talking about what this means on the ground and Jared for the economics of this. We are going to be taking a very short five minute break from our policy sessions to recognize our sponsors. But also, I'd like to bring back WPC President Dan Mead Smith to share a few words. All right. Thank you, Jason. As you heard from Jason's fantastic panel, there are always new efforts for income taxes in our state. And adopting these taxes would be a direct hit on our prosperity. And opportunity for people to move up in this state of ours. And, get, and given the financial hardships coming to our state due to the economic freeze caused by COVID-19, the hunger for more tax revenue amongst many legislators will even be stronger. The efforts for new taxes were relentless when the state was collecting record tax revenue surpluses. So you can imagine how strong the calls for more taxes will be with our new financial realities. Washington Policy Center has taken the lead on exposing these efforts. Jason's research has been instrumental in proving the proposed capital gains tax really was, really is an income tax. His public records requests and our lawsuit against the city of Seattle uncovered the documents proving a statewide income tax was the ultimate play. There is no doubt many nonprofits will need your help this year. But I want to ask that you include Washington Policy Center in your giving by making a contribution today. We were a five, we are a 501c3 tax deductible organization. So your contribution to support our efforts and to join our organization as a member is entirely tax deductible. Those of you who contribute $50 or more to become a member, you'll receive a copy of Roger Stark's new book. You heard Roger talk about during his presentation, Healthcare Policy Simplified understanding a complex issue. This book literally just came in my hands yesterday. 
will be officially released next month. And the late great U.S. Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma describes it as follows. WPC's Roger Stark presents a strong case for less government and more patient control in our healthcare system. He provides the history that brought the country to this point of ever rising healthcare costs. And he discusses the various parts of our healthcare system and how they relate to the growing crisis of care. I think the case for free markets and limited taxation will be needed more than ever over the coming months. And we depend on our donors, thousands of members like you across the strait state to do our work. Please join us. Go to WashingtonPolicy.org and look for the red donate ribbon on the right side of the page. Help us fight for free market solutions and keep Washington income tax free. I hope you'll join us as a member. And next week we continue our weekly series of virtual events. We've been doing these every single week for our members in April. Next week on April 22nd, our Young Professionals Organization is hosting a virtual Earth Day event that I encourage you to sign up for now. So often environmental policy and advocacy is based on ideological agendas, not what does the most environmental good. Our environmental director, Todd Myers, who you heard from this morning, who kicked off our Solution Summit, had a fantastic session and will be talking about smarter approaches to environmental policy and how technology can be used to find meaningful solutions to the problems we face without government mandates. Other speakers will include Sean Frankson, co-founder of Plastic Bank, an incredibly innovative organization seeking to turn waste plastic into profitable recycling, and Benji Backer, a student at the University of Washington and the president and founder of the American Conservative Coalition. It's a great program. The event is free. It's open to all ages. 7 p.m. next Wednesday, the 22nd. Register today at WashingtonPolicy.org. And don't forget that tomorrow, we'll have a whole new lineup of panels for you, including a panel of individuals who live through socialism and will offer, offer their warnings concerning the growing embrace of it here in Washington State. We'll also look at transportation, education, and agriculture policy. Get the full agenda on our website or look for it on the email you received when you registered. Right now, I'd like to return for a minute to offer our gratitude to our sponsors, and then we'll be joined by our Center for Small Business Director, Mark Harmsworth, who just joined our team in January, and we're thrilled to have him. He's doing fantastic work, especially during these COVID times and the impact it's having on small businesses in our state. This panel will be starting in a couple minutes. Welcome back to the Solution Summit with Mark Harmsworth, Washington Policy Center Small Business Director. Well, welcome back. My name is uh, Mark Harmsworth. I'm the uh, Center for Small Business Director for the Policy Center. As you may know, I'm a former state representative from the 44th District. Some may say I'm a recovering state representative from the 44th District. And I've owned and operated my own small business for a number of years now. I've also worked in the tech industry for large corporations like Microsoft and Amazon and have been uh, very blessed to work, uh, live and work in the wonderful Pacific Northwest. The focus of this policy session is on the over-regulation of our small businesses in Washington State. And as always, if you have any questions for me or any other panelists, WPC's Communications Director, David Bowes, is on the line and monitoring the chat function. So up there or over there, depending on what your screen's doing, you can just type in your question to the GoToWebinar chat box at any time, and we'll collect those for a presentation of the panel a little bit later in the program here. Before we begin with our main topic, I wanted to briefly share some of the work we've been doing lately regarding the impact our state's response to COVID-19 has had on small businesses in Washington. You know, it's been, a, it's been a critical time for a lot of businesses, but the small business, which is the backbone of Washington State, has seen some of the biggest impacts um, uh, to revenue and to customer bases. And so what we've been trying to do in the Small Business Center is put articles out that talk about ways in which we can solve these problems. Uh, if you go to our website at WashingtonPolicy.org, you'll see articles that cover uh, some things that we're talking about on COVID-19, how small businesses can partner with the state and vice versa, how we can use uh, tax deferral and other mechanisms to help our small businesses to uh, try and stay, keep those doors open. Obviously, at the federal level, we've got a lot that's going on with uh, uh, the the uh, PPP payment and the, the, the uh, payroll tax stuff that the, the feds have come out with, which is definitely helping. 
Um, but also at the state level, uh, we've seen uh, deferrals on property tax, which affects both business and uh, residential. And we've also seen things uh, around B&O taxes as well, pro proposals around B&O taxes as well. And these are, these are great policies that will definitely help our small businesses because some businesses may only carry 30, 60, 90 days worth of uh, capital in their bank accounts. And so having that extra uh, ability to uh, get over the hump there and make that happen is, is super critical. Um, a lot of employers, uh, every day is critical at this point, and every minute that we stay closed down is, is more uh, opportunity or, or a risk that we're going to see more and more layoffs. And I know a lot of small business owners have stepped up to the plate, um, and they're, they're working hard uh, to try and keep their employees on payroll as long as they possibly can. We've also seen um, legislation from the federal government around the FCC spectrum and helping rural broadband keep us all connected. And I know they've been working hard with opening up the lower ends of the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum to allow rural areas to have great internet during this time because, as you know, we're all dependent on internet. Um, and my own kids right now are about to start their class for the day. And so if I start breaking up, they're sucking all my bandwidth up. But uh, hopefully we won't get that problem. But uh, the internet is super important for our small businesses as we've seen a lot that can work at home are now working at home. And uh, that, that connection is super important. I'd like to turn to, to the panel and start introducing some folks that have been kind enough to join us today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Janice Huxford and her husband, Life, uh, her husband, Lifetime Lake Stevens resident, Dave Warwick. The, together, they formed the Snohomish Valley Roofing Company in 99, expanded in 2004 to include SVR construction services to haul the construction waste recyclables from job sites to certified recycling establishments. And they've also been honored and awarded the Chamber of Business of the Year, multiple Everett Reader's Choice Awards, and have earned over two decades of A-plus business, Better Business Bureau ratings. After a successful 25-year career in wires technology, Janice currently serves the community as a Lake Stevens Planning Commissioner, which she has done since 2010, and she proudly supports the Lake Stevens Food Bank, the Chamber of Commerce, and the nonprofit rescue organization Bulldog Haven Northwest. Uh, Janice, uh, thanks so much for being here. Do you want to just introduce yourself for a minute or so and uh, tell us about your business? Thank you so much, Mark, for having me, and thank you for the Washington Policy Center for including me and my company in this um, in this event. Uh, we are proud of what we do. Like all small businesses, uh, we, and it was just mentioned on the previous panel, we are blue collar. We have been hit hard by what's going on right now. And I'll talk about that hopefully a little bit later in the discussion, but we do have the ability to do work and we will be asking and continue to raise our hand to say, put us back to work. We 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 can be doing that. So uh, happy to be here, happy to lend my voice and um, proud of, of the work that we've done to get us this far. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Janice. Uh, remember, if you have any questions for Janice or any of the other panelists about the regulation of small business in general, please use the chat function. David Bose will pick that up and WPC staff are collecting these questions now for our Q&A later in this program. Our next guest is State Representative Brandon Vick. Uh, he lives down in Clark County, and uh, I had the pleasure of serving with Brandon, where I would consider him a close friend, and uh, we served for four years in the legislature. He still is there. Uh, he was the 2017 Vancouver Statesman of the Year and served on the Clark County Solid Waste Advisory Commission. He owns his own landscaping company and has firsthand experience with the difficulties in regulation and the mandates that they can bring on small businesses. Uh, Representative Vic has spearheaded efforts to reform occupational licensing, which is a big issue for our state, and we're gonna hear more about that later. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Brandon. It's great to have you here at the summit. Do you I just wanna introduce yourself and tell us about your business? Well, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Uh, it is an interesting time, not only as a legislator, but as a small business person who is uh, apparently non-essential at the moment. Uh, we do have a landscape construction company. It's been in my family since 1961, so I'm third generation doing that. Uh, you know, construction's tricky. There's ups and there's downs, and that's an economic cycle usually. Um, 07 was bad, 2001 was bad, and uh, this was shaping up to be a great year until we were told, you know, sorry, you can't work anymore. 
Um, you know, it's difficult. Uh, this is a business in Washington that is very cyclical. You don't work a lot when it rains. Um, so it was getting ready to be the good time. It was March, it was April, things were drying up. We were staffing up and, um, and those folks are sitting waiting, wondering what's next along with us. Um, you know, we're fortunate. We're probably not, you know, gonna go out of business. Um, we do plan well, we have these things, but, but that's not true for a lot of the competition. Um, especially if you're just starting out. So I'm um, happy to be here today, happy to talk about these issues. Hopefully we can convince the governor to reopen some of this economy uh, in short order and uh, and look forward to the chat. Uh, thanks, Brandon. Um, my next panelist is uh, Ryan Neal. Ryan is a seasoned investor, a director and advisor with more than a decade of experience in collaborating with the owners and managers of private companies to increase their value. He has deep expertise in strategic planning, growth strategy, and execution. Ryan is the president and co-founder of Blueprint Technologies and has started or purchases over 15 companies in his career. Blueprint's focus is on groundbreaking, groundbreaking digital products and solutions to bring uh, to help reimagine business and build for the future. It's my privilege to bring to the Solutions Summit platform my former boss and my friend, Ryan Neal, who is also a WPC Society member. Ryan. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Um, thanks for the Washington Policy Center for uh, hosting this event and for everything everybody does. It's an awesome organization. So I, um, for me, you know, small businesses are near and dear to my heart. Uh, both my parents were entrepreneurs. My mom was a serial entrepreneur and kind of inspired me to get uh, um, to have entrepreneurship in my blood. Um, so I grew up in small businesses and saw the ups and downs and 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 also how critical they are to the American DNA and, and also um, our uh, uh, local uh, state and local economies. Um, you know, what I really do is I specialize in um, uh, facilitating helping startups grow really, really fast and then helping organizations that are in trouble uh, scale up, stabilize and scale up. And so we have a few different organizations. I think I own uh, seven different companies right now. Um, the majority of them are small businesses. Um, so, you know, it's very uh, this this is a, this event is a, um, very important and uh, um, uh, uh, very the Washington Policy Center. So sort the of great work for us to be able to get through this tough time. Thanks, Ryan. And just again, reminder, uh, we've got some real down to earth business leaders here. So if you have questions for them, they've got some great experiences and thoughts about this, put it in the chat box and we'll ask that question later. Uh, the final panelist, but no by, no by the least panelist, of course, is Tom Hoban. Tom Hoban is the chairman of the Coast Group of Companies, a collection of commercial real estate firms involved in investment and management of over $5 billion dollars of apartment, commercial, industrial, and self-storage properties throughout the Pacific Northwest. He and his brother, Sean, the group's president, co-founded their first company 33 years ago with $1,200, a pickup truck, I hope it was a Ford, and a Mac computer. Tom is also a columnist, freelance writer, a former adjunct professor of entrepreneurship, affording him a broad platform with which he's able to connect with others. Tom serves on over a dozen boards, including the Governor's Affordable Housing Advisory Board, the Santa Clara University Real Estate School Advisory Board, the Board of Trustees at the University of Portland, as well as several startups and early stage companies focused on disruptive technologies in real estate. Uh, Tom earned his BA in finance from the University of Notre Dame in 84. And I think I speak for everyone here. Welcome to the summit, Tom. Just give us a quick, uh, brief introduction and uh, tell us about what you've been doing. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me okay, guys? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying this. I uh, One of the things I did in this COVID environment is cut my own hair. It's the first time I really looked at myself and I'm a little freaked out by it. I <laughs> uh, hope everybody's getting through this okay. Um, a lot of thoughts and prayers out to every small business uh, and everybody affected by this. Our business touches lots of slices of the economy, and so in many ways we're sort of a early canary in a coal mine type of business. Uh, this isn't our first rodeo. My brother and I have been business partners and have added others to that uh, business partnership um, cadre over the years. So 33 years together, we've been through you know the SNL crisis, dot com crash, you know 9/11, uh, real estate crash, and now this. They're all well, what would you say they have one thing in common? They all hit you from a blind side. And then after that, they have almost nothing in common. So I'm happy to be here, uh, flattered and honored to be part of this. 
Thanks, Tom, for joining us. Um, so I'm going to dive right into questions, uh, and we're going to start with Janice. Um, with the COVID-19 crisis causing significant issues for small business, what do you think would be the one or maybe two things the state could do to ease the burden from a regulatory perspective on your business? The obvious question, they can put us back to work. If my roofers are any closer than six feet on a roof, there's something wrong with the roofers. There's no reason for us to be um, shuttering in place and for our employees to be, we're paying for our employees, we're choosing to do that route, to have faith in the programs that have been extended, but our employees right now want to work. We have the business out there. Our customers are, are wanting us to get these things done for them and we don't have that ability. So if there is a safe way that uh, Washington State can soft launch certain, certain parts of certain industries, and I don't want to say pick me, pick me, but we are one of those certain parts of a certain industry that could right now, today, go back to work and have our employees um, be able to do what they do well. The other things are, um, when you talk about regulations, I, I would follow the, the uh, lead of, for example, our insurance company contacted us and said, we know that you aren't working as you normally would right now. So we're gonna lessen that, that, um, that debt. We're gonna lessen the amount of liability that you need to pay for because you don't have people up on the roof. And that was um, uh, something that we didn't raise our hand to ask for, but was so needed. And, and if other, or you know, B&O taxes perhaps being deferred, certainly once we are back, if the state would, alleviate any um, any time spent on uh, any sort of auditing, any sort of on-site inspections, anything that has to do with um, uh, deflecting from what it is that we do, we're gonna come back, we're gonna come back strong, we're gonna come back with a lot of work and we need to focus on what we do. And if they could give us a period of time for things to calm, I think that would go a long way, certainly in the construction industry. Uh, Ryan, parts of your business are less manufacturing uh, based. I know you do have some manufacturing, but if you could talk to us about how, um, uh, along the same lines as what Janice has just responded to, how this would affect your consulting and your tech industries, what you think the state could be doing? Yeah, the uh, um, yeah, it's a good question. The you know. I follow the same line as Tom, you know, the, the, you know, going through all these different, um, these, the, the different crises that we've been through, you know, one of the things that we've learned is, is, you know, they are all different, but the, 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 the faster we're able to get back and recover um, is a direct, it like month over month directly impacts the overall economy and it affects everybody. Um, so the speed and the pace at which we can all get back up to speed um, and get back at a fully functioning workforce is is huge. For me, I really look at it from an entrepreneurship standpoint. And you know, regardless of the of the the COVID impact, um, entrepreneurs are um, you know, especially in that you know the startup phase up to about a hundred million dollars in revenue. They 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 I I believe that they get hit the hardest by the state. Um, the the companies that are starting up you immediately month one regardless of whether or not you either have you know you have a little bit of revenue you get hit with a bno tax bill right off the bat for the privilege of just doing business in the state and at a time when a company you know an, an entrepreneurial company that's trying to start needs to conserve its cash and be able to funnel it towards the actual business itself the state immediately steps in and takes a handout when they're using the least amount of infrastructure so for me i mean i really think you know the you know, like you know def, um not even deferring, like to giving giving startups a, the first year or two of of their business inception, uh, no no B and O tax, would help spur the entrepreneur community and help a lot of businesses um, uh, really really launch. Um, as well, I mean, my big thing is it's still it's still unbelievable for me that the Washington State had um, treats its, uh, takes its B and O tax based on revenue, and a lot of the local jurisdictions take it based on headcount, not profitability. It doesn't respect any of the fact that the health of the business. Um, it just takes it takes the uh, it takes the tax regardless. So for me, that's my biggest area of reform that I'd love to see. 
That's great. You know, there may have been a representative that introduced a bill very similar to that, but uh, didn't get out of committee, unfortunately. We'll so work on that you. another so time. I love you, Mark. Yeah. Uh, representative Vic, uh, the state's created an overburdensome structure for licensing in the state. What do you think the state could do to reduce the occupational licensing requirements on small business? And I think this is in your wheelhouse. <laughs> well, thanks, Mark. You know, we did uh, run up a, a package of bills this year on this topic. I think there were six altogether. Um, some success out of committee, out of the House. Um, I have to work on the Senate a little bit next year, I think. But, um, you know, there's a, a wide variety of things we could do. I mean, there's an approach that Arizona took, which is take all comers, and then there's there's everything between that and, and full licensing. Um, what we propose, I think, makes a lot of sense in the short term, though. The first is just Let's look at reciprocity, right? If it was good enough for another state, why isn't it good enough for us? Uh, obviously, there's probably some examples where there is no testing or or no standards whatsoever in a, in a critical profession. Um, but why are the states less smart than us? You know, I'm not sure that they are. I don't think that they are. So let's really work on that reciprocity angle and getting people to work fast. Um, along those same lines, does it have to be a written test? Does it have to be a book learn test, right? Can it be a skills-based test? Can people go out and show they can install an HVAC system, show they can be an electrician, show they can do uh, daycare or whatever the, the license is for? I think a real skills-based test not only um, shows people who move into our state that yes, we're serious, we want you to get to work, we want you to contribute, um, but you can do so without doing another two years of school for the, the career you've been involved in for your entire life or uh, without this extra license or certificate that we put you through just because we thought we knew a little better. I think those are two uh, real big things. What I want to see is also a sunset review when it comes around to occupational licenses. You know, we put these licenses into effect um, in theory, for good reasons. I don't think I always agree with them, but that's fine. Um, let's look at them every two, three, five years and say, is this license still valid? Is it still doing the right thing? Is it serving the purpose it meant to serve? Or can we scrap this or at least adjust the terms by which a person needs to uh, achieve to, to uh, get this license? And then finally, this one is a little less popular in all circles, but I think when it comes to convicted felons who have served their time and, and paid their debt to society, we need to make sure that that conviction is not an automatic barrier to entry to any profession. Now, if you were you know, uh, funneling money away from a company, you're probably not gonna get a, a financial advisor's license, or if you were abusing children, we're not gonna give you a daycare license, but does that mean you can't be an electrician? Does that mean you can't uh, go out there and build something? Does it mean you can't go out there and be uh, go to work and be a productive? productive member of society. Um, those are things we've really been looking at. Um, obviously, we need to get our vets to work and our military spouses to work faster. There's a number of things we can do and we've been working on, but those are uh, a handful of ideas to start. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, Tom, uh, you've worked in possibly some of the most regulated business in the state. What have you seen as the most time-consuming activity the state requires of your company that could be reformed? Yeah, well, we have uh, several companies, and um, um, just so that uh, those participating in this know, uh, I'm basically in the shelter business. So whether we own a, an apartment building or we own a mixed-use building or we're managing a retail or office building, uh, we're we're involved in the regulation of mostly real estate development and the operations of it. So like an operating business, uh, Janice's comments and others, uh, both Ryan and Brandon's, I couldn't agree more with everything they've said. We face those same issues. But as I look deeper and kind of go around the edge to where we're seeing regulation hold things up has been almost exclusively, for me at least, in uh, the cost of housing driven by all the red tape uh, that's baked into the cost to deliver it. So on the governor's affordable housing advisory board, I kind of came to it as a supply side, sider, trying to uh, really bring some business literacy and some thought into uh, balancing uh, both uh, keeping up with supporting income on the demand side uh, for folks who need the support and help, but what can we do to really just re-examine, uh, maybe uh, to borrow Brandon's uh, great idea, sunset everything and then revisit it and decide if we really need that. And in the process, we might effectively reduce the cost to deliver the housing. Once it's up and going, you know, we we run it, we manage it, you know, we do our very best. But when you're at the front line, says we are uh, dealing with people in their 
their business in their homes uh, in uh, in the apartment business, uh, especially really see the burden placed upon them that we're stuck handing to them because of the baked in heavy cost to deliver and, uh, and develop property. So I've spent a lot of time on that. Thanks, Tom. Uh, this next question before we go to uh, the audience questions is for Ryan and Janice. Um, L&I is currently a state run monopoly. Uh, what do you see as the best reform that we can do for L&I to reduce costs and ease the burden on small business and ultimately then reduce the cost of services that uh, are charged to consumers. Ryan, do you mind if I go first? Go for it. I can um, share a, a story uh, very briefly that the week before Christmas 2018, um, we, our company was served with a uh, fine of close to six figures. Um, it's the one and only time I think in 25 years of marriage that I met Dave at the door as he came home with a mixed drink and said, finish this before you read the mail. Um, we, we were able to successfully appeal that. Um, and I'm very proud of that, by the way, because not everybody can, but we are a small business. We don't have someone in our office to do this. This was us fighting L and I. And to go through that pop process, and it was something that they had changed. They wanted to code our drivers in the driving side of our business as roofers, and they were then were backdating that and then finding us for not being coded correctly, even though our drivers are never on the roof. But don't get me started there. So the um, the successful outcome, though, was predicated on three months of hard work of me aligning with um, some of our organizations in Olympia to, to get a very fast education on how to do this. And I had to do a public records request act, act request to get my own information, to get my own past audits. They, L and I was not helping me through this process. And so I would say, and Ryan I'm sure has his own horror stories that he can add, but what I would say is help me Help me as a business owner, help me as an employer, help me as an investor in, in our local um, county here, our community here, help me answer what you need to have answered so that we can then uh, continue to do what we do well and you can go on to somebody that perhaps has issues that you need to address, but help me. So I will offer that example that one, it can be one, that there are great organizations in Olympia and others that will help you through it, uh, but to fight, fight, and, and hopefully Elle and I will hear this and, and help us. Yeah, I completely agree. And you know, feel free in that story, like we've been through, I can't even, four different Elle and I audits um, and by different companies and they're all extremely painful. Um, but then also, you know, we we employ, I think employ employees in probably 17 different states. Um, and there's only four that are monopolistic, um, only four left, right? Um, um, it's an antiquated system um, and it doesn't provide any kind of an incentive to businesses. Um, and it doesn't really, it, it, it doesn't it, it, uh, um, uh, protect the employees any better than the non-monopolistic states. Um, you still have to get in, uh, workers' comp coverage in all the other states, and you have to provide the same amount of care um, for those individuals. So um, it's really it's really a throwback to a legacy a legacy way of doing things that Washington State just isn't the, isn't willing to give up. Um, for me, I would I would love uh, to see it opened up. Um, you know, I, I I personally believe that that uh, um, systems like L and I they give it, uh, entrepreneurs a disincentive to have employees. They actually make they make entrepreneurs want to actually create a business that does not employ people. Right. It's a kind of a running joke with the majority of my entrepreneur counterparts is the ideal business is a steady stream of revenue with zero employees because you don't not because the employees are a pain in the ass. Some of them are, uh, but uh, most of them are really good. Uh, but it's because the regulations you have to jump through to be able to actually keep employees employed, uh, mostly because of Washington State. You know, um, so, uh, yeah, I, I would love to see it opened up. Uh, um, uh, to for people to be able to get a you know privatized equivalent of workers' compensation alongside the uh, L and I. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Ryan. And I understand French, so I know what you were talking about just a moment ago. 
Um, but yeah, the the opening up across state lines and also to private industry, I think, is going to be uh, critical to reducing that cost because it introduces uh, free market. It, you know, some competition there, which would be great. Uh, Mr. Bowes, I believe you will have some questions for us. If you could throw the first one at us, that will be great. Yes, we do, Mark. The first question deals with Governor Inslee and the panel. How well do you all feel? The governor has explained his process for restarting the economy and his general handling uh, of business during the shutdown. <laughs> Representative Vic, would you like to take that or would you like me to do it? <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is a, a major bugaboo for I think every elected official and I can't imagine how an average constituent not involved feels because the communication is zero. Uh, the communication is all about public health, which obviously this is a public health problem. Um, but how do we start the economy? How long businesses are going to be shut down? What businesses are going to come back first? What are the steps to do that? Uh, none of that information is coming from the governor's office and it's not coming to us. I mean, we're getting this information in the same press conference as everybody else is. Um, and it's something we've really been working with as chief of staff on, on trying to improve. Um, I will say a, a silver lining is apparently a committee is forming with two members of each uh, political caucus uh, to start to discuss these issues. Uh, many of us have done it on our own, though. Our caucus has a plan for tax policy, for regulatory policy, for budget policy, um, because when we do go back to that special session, and I have to imagine that happens, we're going to have to deal with these things. Um, we are begging the governor to please, I know you probably can't give complete assurance, but at least some guidance to folks. What does normal look like after this? When can we start behaving normally? When can businesses start hiring those folks back? Um, so, so how is it going? I, I would say it's not going well there. Yeah, I would add in there, I know there are industry groups out there that are working hard. Um, construction is a great example of this to uh, come up with recommendations on how to safely resume um, because it's not flip the bit and the whole economy just restarts. We're going to see a gradual resumption of these uh, industries. And I know they've been working to come up with specific recommendations, which I think a lot of industry groups, if they're listening in on this uh, webcast, should be thinking about because they understand their industries much better than the government does. And being able to pre present those to uh, the governor so that he's able to put that out. But I agree, Representative Vic, that um, there needs to be more transparency in what's going on. And we need we need a planning right now, not the day we want to switch this thing back on so that there's some certainty. If a small business knows he's got two or three weeks to go before he can reopen his doors, then he can plan. He can figure out how to how to deal with the, the financial impact of that. Um, so, yeah, transparency and let's get this planning done now. Let's get the industry groups involved with this so we can have a, a good solution. Uh, Mr. Bowes, next question. For those construction companies presenting currently, what are your safety plans or where are you finding safety plans to address the spread of COVID-19 COVID for your workforce? Tom, do you want to take this? Well, I, I'll probably defer to Janice. I think okay. she's got people that are more out in the, in the field, but I'll say some of our, well, almost all of our businesses are deemed essential businesses. Uh, we're, we're kind of at the front lines, pretty much the last, you know, security guards. <laughs> on the uh, properties we manage and, and you know, protecting uh, these assets so that they're positioned for people to go back to work or come back and open their businesses. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, we've changed a lot. We got on this early. We tried to find out what the best practices were um, and have, you know, been basically deployed as an essential service business for about the last two, three weeks. Happy to dig into that, but I think Janice probably got a lot of frontline stuff she can talk about. I, uh, to go to the previous question, just briefly, we were essential one day, we were non-essential the next day. And so within 24 hours, we were told one thing and then another thing. So during the time that we were, which is a blow to the ego, by the way, non-essential, um, but we, we had already put into place when we were still considered essential where our roofers go directly to the, the job site. We call the customer in advance. Uh, of course, the job's already loaded by a company that does that. That isn't us that do that, so that's on them. 
Um, the roofers don't come into our office. They never see the customer and they're never next to each other because you roof from opposite sides of the roof. Obviously, that's how you do that. And so there was zero um, contact with the public or each other. And then our office is scheduling in advance so that the um, customer doesn't come out and shake their hand or want to. We've also done things like um, just with our company, um, we um, our, our drivers never get out of their truck. So every truck drug a driver has a truck that they go to pick up the recyclables and they never have to. Everything is auto tarped. Everything is done. They don't see the customer. They don't see the contractor. Um, and so everything is very um, isol. Everybody is very isolated. And we were already doing that before we were deemed non-essential. And that's why we're saying we could very easily come back. And quite honestly, I think it would be a boost to people that are um, stuck at home and, and are starting to, you know, just want to see humans. I think that if they heard that there were parts of industries that were able to go back, I think that they would appreciate the fact that that we've been allowed to simply because they know that there are people that are heading heading that direction instead of um, the opposite way. Yeah, it's not like we're trying to pick winners or losers. We're just looking at each industry and saying, hey, it's, it's relatively easy, you're self-regulating and you're taking uh, you're taking the right steps to keep people safe, both the workers and the customers. So you should be able Absolutely. to resume, just like the the public construction industry. He didn't even get shut down. So uh, the private industry, your business, um, there are businesses that can reopen. You think about landscaping businesses that could definitely perform the work they're doing because they're segregated. And Mark, uh, I would just add, if I could. Um, there, there's not a need for a lot of people to reinvent the wheel either on this. I mean, most industries have a trade association group, the builders, the hospitalities, the realtors, whatever. These yeah. folks uh, are paid to help you out with this type of stuff. They come up with the plans. They've asked the legal questions. They've had the lawyers on board. So if you're out there floundering and you have a trade association group, even if you haven't paid into it yet, they're there to help right now. Most of them are doing it pro bono. Obviously, joining would be a, an added bonus. But um, there's folks who have done this work already. You don't need to do it yourself. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, Mr. Bose. Is it legally possible to convince various mayors to declare all construction essential, as some have done? If our governor can override POTUS, then can't mayors override the governor? It appears that Governor Inslee is not going to relent, and now that he's agreed to align with California and Oregon, it seems even less likely. Uh, could mayors uh, do something about this and we might as well include county executives in that as well well that's an interesting question uh david i uh as you know uh, the city of linden recently put out a declaration uh saying that they were going to allow construction within their uh, city limits and uh, it's basically set up a, a a showdown between them and the state on uh, who owns the the legislative authority here um, I think that uh, under the state of emergency, the governor probably does, but it's it's very interesting. I don't know if Representative Vic had, he's been closer to it this year, if he's had any other uh, insight into this. And I'll be interested to see how Linden works this out, but they could be one of the first cities that sort of starts the ball rolling on this. Uh, I know they're doing it with safety in mind. They're, they're trying to keep their both their inspectors and their employees safe from a city's perspective and the construction workers as well. So um, I'm eager to see how that plays out. Uh, Brandon, do you have anything you want to add? I have zero legal opinion on this, but um, I, I will say I think there is that that test coming into play of, of who's going to blink first, maybe. Um, you know, uh, there's also the question of what is law enforcement going to enforce? Um, you know, how, how bad do they want to come after somebody who's, you know, selling ice cream cones out of an ice cream truck? You know, I mean, there's a lot of things out there that I think we have to realize that um, everyone took this seriously, I think. And there's a lot of folks looking at how to rebuild, how to come out of it, how to do things safely. Um, there's a number of industries that are closed that have safety regulations in place for health, for, for a variety of factors. And so I think, um, while I don't know that anyone should go and, and you know stick their fist in the governor's face and challenge him directly, I think this really is a time where that tension exists because not everyone agrees. Uh, not everyone sees it the same way. Uh, I think your local health departments and your local police are the ones who are enforcing most of the regulations. Um, so maybe I'd, I'd 
lean on that uh, end of the scale a little heavier. Um, but as far as a legal opinion, I cannot tell you if a mayor has that authority or, or not. Ron, Ron, I had a question for you. Uh, for the for the consultants that you've got placed at customer sites, how have your customers been dealing with this? Uh, are they keep are they asking your uh, employees to go on premise, or are they allowing them to work at home? No, yeah, we, um, you know, the we saw this uh, com coming down, and you know, we the being at the kind of the epicenter, just a, we were in headquartered in downtown Bellevue. Um, so just south of Kirkland and and seeing this coming um, with our workforce, we were able to mobilize our entire workforce within 72 hours to be able to work remote. Um, and luckily, the, the majority of our um, companies actually made that a, man, a, a mandatory um, soon after. So we were already ready. Um, and uh, we've repurposed all the folks that are supporting our facilities into different projects. And um, so we, we haven't had to lay off anybody as of yet, which is great. Um, but uh, as far as our customers go, you know, we have we have customers all around the nation in different areas, and you know, it's it's kind of the it's the good and bad thing about the 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 hundred percent shutdown across the entire state is at least it forced everybody that was on the fence to be able to clamp down, um, you know, because we have we have employees that are in New York City that they're way behind the curve and have no idea how they're going to be able to deal with things. Um, and the impact that's going to have across the board. Um, so at least it, it gives it for us, our perspective is it gives us the be a better chance to be able to recover quickly. Thanks. Next question, Mark. Uh, this one's for Janice. She had mentioned uh, being able to return to work safely, uh, but also conceded that she, uh, she knows that her business can already return to work safely based on uh, the spacing issues. So uh, with that in mind, how uh, and and the fact that public construction is open with that in mind how can she expect um, the governor to change his uh, view on when these businesses should open if uh, if the evidence is already overwhelming that she could return to work just as safely as any public construction mm. we could return to work uh, we want to return to work we don't want to be the co the company though our com our, you know we don't, we don't want to be that company that is the one that's rolling when everybody else is abiding by the rules now there are companies in our industry in the, in the construction industry that are starting to if you're if you're an interior house painter no one's going to see you paint the interior of a house but if i have my roofers with my truck on your in your neighborhood you're going to see us you're going to know that and, and I don't want to be that company. We never have been, we, we don't want to be that. But my point, I guess, and I hope that I'm answering the question, my point being, if, if the McDonald's in Snohomish can be remodeled during this, because it is the greater good of, of the city of Snohomish, then why can't my company, why can't my roofers safely um, go back to work and and start to do some of the the jobs that we have um in our queue and that would be my only plea and i respectfully plea that i'm not i'm not shaking my fist to to um to uh, quote representative vic but I, I i respectfully ask that there be a lift to some organizations inside some industry throughout the state so that um, we can put our employees back to work hopefully that answers the question yeah, and I think that many, many folks consider every job that we do is essential because at the end of the day, we have to pay our mortgages and buy our food and clothing and so forth. Um, so, uh, you know, again, we're not picking winners and losers here, but let's let's do this the right way for the businesses that know how to do this right now. Let's let's try and get them open as soon as possible. This question is for um, the uh, people with legislative experience on the panel. It's uh, government tends to um, approach problems with a broad brush and overgeneralize when it comes to their own solutions. With the COVID-19 crisis that we face, um, a more nimble approach is required. Is government up to that task? Well, back to the, the comment I made earlier, um, I think with the help of the industry groups and um, the, the, the folks that are talking to the state, 
I think there's a chance that we can see some good policy come out as far as who starts and when starts and how they do their business. Most businesses, and I'm thinking, for example, at the Master Builders Association right now, uh, they, prior to this happening, had uh, guidelines on how their employees should act on premise already. They were self-regulating. They, they saw the writing on the wall and they wanted to avoid uh, any uh, potential shutdown. Now, unfortunately, they got shut down, or at least uh, most of their folks did, because of what the governor did with a, a broad stroke. Um, but as we get closer here, there's the industry groups that, you know, if you think about retail or restaurants, uh, could we're already with retail, we're already open with uh, food, food stores like Safeway and Albertsons and so forth, um, and we're able to do social distancing in there. Why couldn't we do the same based on square footage, for example, for other retail establishments and get folks back in there with some, you know, with some restrictions maybe initially as we amp this thing up? Um, that's a way that the, the state could do this. Do I think they're nimble enough? If they listen carefully um, to what people are saying, I think they could make some changes that are definitely going to help. Um, but if they try to do broad strokes, I think that's where uh, we're going to get into trouble. And it's going to need bipartisan support from um, all four corners, as we would say, the Republican and the Democrat side of the House and the Senate uh, to make these changes and the governor's office to be working with them as we go through this. Brandon, Vic, did you want to mention anything else on that? Well, I think you're right. I think government has the potential to be nimble here. Um, you know, this is a difficult situation. I mean, I don't want to put all the fault on the governor because what do you do in the beginning? I think the 30 day shutdown was probably the, the best option he had. Uh, I think the problem has been uh, being willing to move away from that and restart and think a little more critically on some of these issues. Um, you know, there's there's a we're sending a list to the governor if we haven't already done so of industries we think can reopen, but there are a lot of things that make sense, right? Dentists, you can't go get a, a teeth cleaning or a filling right now. Uh, elective surgeries, our hospitals are about half full in most parts of the state. You know, we didn't have the, the peak that we thought we were going to have. You know, there's a number of things that we can do or the governor could do on his own um, to be nimble and to get these folks who have, you know, proper procedures in place uh, able to get back to work. Um, some of it is going to be legislative. Look, we have to come out of this regardless of whether or not we lift the ban on a certain industry. We've got to come out and we've got to save folks uh, who are cash poor at the moment, who uh, need to restart that business but don't have that BNO tax or the LNI or the paid family leave money sitting in the bank. There are a number of things we absolutely can do uh, to be nimble, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, you got to get the votes. Uh, so that's something we have to do. But but can we do it? Yes. Um, will we do it? You know, that's the bigger question. Uh, the thing here is the governor and the elected representatives, we still have constituencies. You know, the question was asked earlier, how could, could Janice be confident she's going to get back to work? You know, I don't know that she can, but the governor still has to answer to 7 million people at the end of the day. So if enough people start putting that pressure on him to, to open industries X, Y, and Z or to, to get back to normal, that's another part of the equation that, that is real in politics. And so just uh, uh, food for thought, I guess, for folks willing to make those calls. Yeah, I think, Mark, yeah. may, may I weigh in a little bit? Um, I, I think what we're hearing uh, from this panel and, and probably a lot of people uh, watching, listening in, and then just from business in general is that uncertainty is damaging. Um, Janice could make plans if she had some sense that there was a rollout and a strategy and a timing around when we can reopen. We just don't know. And it's it's not to knock the the, the challenges that the government and I, we deal with in seven states, so we're dealing with this everywhere. It's not to knock how hard this is, but my interactions with government generally have led me to conclude that there's just a depth of business literacy that's not very well understood. And so we go into that in this environment, and then and then this one where it's really sensitive, that really shows up. And so I think. If, if governors would, would form, you know, task force is one way to do it, start to send some signals that they've got business at the table advising them on how to do this rollout, I think it would bring a lot of comfort to us and then start to roll out the timing. But, we, you know, we're all going to have strong opinions on when our businesses need to go back to full force and everybody else needs to do their thing. And it's just going to be a lot of noise until they can organize that and give us a sense that business has a seat at the table. So we know that that depth of literacy is baked into their plans. Mm, yeah, I agree. 
Mark, this Maybe. is the last. The, this is the last question for the panel. With every day and uh, every week bringing more small businesses, the likelihood of bankruptcy and more uh, people's individuals uh, savings uh, to total depletion. Uh, and we know that government works very slowly. How do we speed up the typically slow governmental process and uh, get some changes so more of our economy can get back to work um, immediately rather than waiting for another week, another 10 days, or another month? I, um, I'll take a first stab, and then if anyone else wants to jump in here. I, I think uh, what we have seen is um, the the governor has come out and um, waived some of the legislative requirements on things, which has certainly helped, at least for now. But ultimately, long term, um, we're going to need some legislative action to make that change on a, on a longer term basis. The governor's authority only goes for so long on, on suspending and delaying things. Um, so uh, it may require a special session uh, for the legislature to get back in and start um, delaying or or doing some things to state statute to get the doors open, Re reducing uh, to the point that Brandon was talking about earlier on the occupational licensing, um, is reducing those barriers immediately, maybe rolling back some of the legislation that was passed this year on BNO tax increases to help these small businesses get over that hump. But you've got to get at the, we need the government out of the way and ultimately the legislature has to make that decision because it owns the RCWs at the end of the day because they're the lawmakers. And so having that and having some targeted um, areas in which they can focus on in a, in a short special session to, to get the government out of the way, to get these businesses back online as soon as we can safely once things are opening up. Um, and that's, I, I think, one of the things that we certainly need to do. I know after seeing Tom's haircut, uh, I should have married it. Well, I did marry a hairdresser, but apparently I, I got the long hair. But, um, you know, using that as an example is is getting these guys back to work at, at that small business there is, is going to be paramount. Yeah, they, I mean, the businesses need to come back in waves and, and really, I mean, I explained it to my teams where, you know, the, the typical, the typical restaurant runs basically paycheck to paycheck in the individual world. Um, and, you know, a business, a restaurant that shut down for four days out of a given month, that's their profit right there. Right, they are then at break even, and anything longer than four days out of the month that cuts into usually the usually the restaurant owner's savings. Right, they don't have they're not an asset rich business, and they don't usually have extended lines of credit or anything to be able to fund this type of a. In what we were like week five, week going on week six of this, right? And and for me, I just I think this this whole group like the 200. And, it was seven attendees plus everybody else. They need to be as vocal as possible because every week that the government delays at allowing businesses that could go back to work to go back to work right now and do it in a safe way, the longer they delay is a direct correlation on how they how important they think business is to this state, entrepreneurship is to this state, and everybody just needs to be vocal. The construction has to go back to work, the, the roofers have to go back to work, the people who can, because then eventually the restaurant people can go back to work, and those are the people that are getting hammered the most. It's, I mean, it's just decimated. When you, when you walk, it, it's amazing, you can walk around downtown Bellevue and there's not, there's not a single business that's open, and it hasn't been for like five weeks. I mean, that's just brutal. For the employees, yeah. the business owners, um, and so they just need whatever the whatever the logistics. Everybody just needs to get really, really vocal because it's exactly right when the when the when the re-elections come around. This is the time when everybody should remember. Yeah, I can agree more. Well, we're out of time, uh, folks. So I just want to thank each of my panelists. They're obviously very busy people. Um, <laughs> even in this downtime, they're still busy people. Um, and they've given their time generously to us today. Uh, thanks so much for coming. I appreciate everything you've said and done, and I'm sure we'll have some follow-up questions at some point here. And thanks for being part of the WPC's first ever uh, video online summit, uh, solution summit. Uh, now, a, a, a thing I'm particularly uh, excited about is uh, I'm gonna ask Dan Mee Smith, our president, to come back again, and he is gonna be presenting the summit award uh, so here is WPC President Dan Meet Smith. All right, thank you, Mark, and thanks for that great panel. Really easy to resonate with 
those business owners. So I appreciate you bring that together. Thanks to all the panelists who joined us today. What a fantastic program, great day of information. And as Mark said, before we conclude the day, I have a special presentation to make. That is to this year's recipient of our annual Washington Policy Center Summit Award. The Summit Award is given annually to people or organizations that exemplify a solution to a policy problem. We are proud to recognize this year's recipient of the Summit Award, Washington State's Public Affairs Television Network, TVW. TVW's wall-to-wall -wall coverage of our state legislative sessions has brought action in Olympia in reach of every resident in our state, from the remote northwest corner to southwest Washington over to Spokane and Walla Walla. Citizens who otherwise would have extremely limited access to their government due to the time constraints of long distance travel or the clogged highways of the Puget Sound area can now watch gavel to gavel coverage and not miss a debate, a bill, or a vote. Their public affairs programming brings context and clarity to the issues facing our elected representatives, and their online services aid citizens in keeping elected officials to their word and holding them to account for their actions. TBW's steady, continuous push for more coverage has made for a better Washington. I'd like to welcome to the, to the screen Renee Radcliffe Sinclair, the president of TBW. Renee is a former state representative herself, former director of education policy for several Western states for Apple, and the former CEO of the Everett Area Chamber of Commerce. Renee has been president of TBW for more than five years. And we are pleased to have her accept the Summit Award on behalf of TBW today. Great. Well, Dan, it's really nice to see you, uh, but I have to say it's nice to see anybody right now. I'm really missing uh, seeing the folks at work every day. And thank you so much uh, for this incredibly nice recognition from the Washington Policy Center. Uh, last Friday, TVW actually celebrated our 25th anniversary of gavel to gavel coverage of the state legislature, everything coming out of the governor's office, uh, the Supreme Court, state agency boards and commissions. And uh, we are, after 25 years, just incredibly proud of the work that we do to be your lens on state, gov on state government. Uh, we were founded on the principle that Washington citizens have a right to know what their government is doing. And uh, we're very pleased and proud to be able to receive this recognition of our work to make that happen. And uh, even though we are in a period of pandemic, uh, we are covering everything out of the governor's office. We've even put uh, two of our produced shows inside Olympia and the impact back into production mode. We're doing everything remotely, uh, but getting valuable information out to residents of Washington about the resources that are available to them during uh, this period of pandemic. So uh, once again, thank you for this recognition. If you're wondering how you can access our content, we are available on cable television. Check your local listings. We have a Roku channel. We have um, mobile device apps for Apple and Android devices. And of course, we are always streaming at tvw.org and quite often on Facebook too. Thanks, Renee. And you're streaming our event today. So thanks we for doing are. that for the next two days. Um, we sent Renee the plaque. We wanted to give it to her in person, obviously. And there is the award. And it it's reads beautiful. the Washington Policy Center 2020 Summit Award recognizes TVW for excellence and commitment to providing all Washingtonians equal access to the public work of the legislature, the governor, and other aspects of state government. TVW reduces the geographical distances that separate Washington residents from their elected representatives and creates more open, accessible, and accountable government for everyone. Congratulations, Renee, and to your entire staff at TVW. Thank you. TBW has been a great partner of ours. We value their contribution to the cause of greater transparency and civil, civil policy debate. So congratulations again, Renee. Tomorrow we kick off day two. We had a great first day of our virtual solution summit. Tomorrow we'll kick off with America's flirtation with socialism, which will include a round table discussion, very unique with people who have actually lived in socialist countries and experience firsthand the destruction they create on the human spirit and human potential. We'll follow that up with an analysis of modern transportation policy that too often makes the error of presuming drivers are the enemy. Then we'll turn to school choice programs, a topic with enormous 
relevance even more so now that our schools have been shut down for the remainder of the school year. And to wrap it all up, we'll look at the urban rural divide in food production. Agriculture is one of Washington's top employers, so it's a vital interest for all Washingtonians. And with COVID-19 causing some to question our supply lines, it's even more important than ever for policymakers and voters on both sides of the state to know more about where our food comes from. I wanna thank our sponsors again. We really couldn't do this, a lot of moving parts, even virtually to put this together. So I wanna thank all of our sponsors, America, um, first off, Associated Builders and Contractors, Assured Partners, MCM, Avara, Coldwell Banker Bain, Dunn Lumber, Nika, Trico, Wells Fargo, Bristol Myers Squibb, Merck, Boeing Company, Takeda, Dairy Gold, the Ethnic Chamber of Commerce Coalition, Physicians Insurance, and American Printing. Thanks to everyone who attended today. We had over 300 people registered for the event. Um, and I appreciate everyone who's a member of the organization. Your support, especially during these challenging times, is very much appreciated. If you make a contribution of $50 or more today, even if you're a member, or if you wanna join Washington Policy Center, you'll receive a copy of Roger Stark's new book that I talked about earlier, Healthcare Policy Simplified, Understanding a Complex Issue, very timely, especially during this time. And uh, the book hasn't even been released yet, so you'll get the first copy when it's released. Dr. Stark presents a strong case for less government and more patient control in our healthcare system. And I know you'll find it a, a great read when it comes out and you receive it next month. If you're new to Washington Policy Center, maybe this is even your first event, I encourage you to join us. Memberships start as low as $50. It includes research publication mailings, our quarterly magazine viewpoint, our email updates, access to our one-stop policy shops like what we're doing on COVID-19. The economy in Washington State and invitations to events like the Solution Summit at discounted membership rates. This event was free, like many of our events are for WPC members. Thanks everybody for watching. We hope you'll join us on our social media pages to continue talking about these issues. We had lots of questions, we couldn't get to them all. We'll keep talking about them on our social media pages. And we look forward to another great day of our statewide Solution Summit starting tomorrow at 8 a.m. Have a great rest of your day.